Education and Workforce will come to order. Welcome, everyone. I note that a quorum is present. Without objection, the chair is authorized to call a recess at any time. The committee is meeting today to hear testimony on the state of our education system. And uh, I'm going to make a quick explanation for why we're meeting in the judiciary room. Uh, we had a broken water main in the education committee, and all of our electronic equipment is inoperable. And so we're thankful to the Judiciary Committee for allowing us to use this room today uh, for this very important hearing. Pursuant to Committee Rule 8C, opening statements are limited to the chair and the ranking member so that we may hear from the witnesses sooner and provide all members with adequate time to ask questions. I now recognize myself for the purpose of making an opening statement. From elementary school to law school, the state of this nation's education system is deeply troubling at every level. Republicans want transparency and innovative solutions to the problems in our education system, while Democrats want taxpayers to fork over their hard-earned paychecks to empower the D.C. bureaucracy. One of my top priorities as chairwoman of the Education Workforce Committee is to protect parental rights. During the pandemic, parents saw firsthand how poorly our current K-12 education system is serving students. These parents witnessed the education establishment put the interest of teachers' unions over the interest of their children. Parents witnessed educators spreading political ideology instead of teaching fundamental subjects like mathematics and reading. And parents witnessed their children fall further and further behind academically. This learning loss has been devastating, causing millions of students to lose years of academic progress. The 2022 National Assessment of Educational Progress, NAEP, saw scores for nine-year-olds decline five points in reading and seven points in math compared to 2020. This is the largest average decline in reading since 1990 and first ever decline in math. Parents have reason to be angry and should have every opportunity to express their concerns. Instead, they were stonewalled, silenced, and intimidated. Some parents were even forcibly removed from school board meetings, investigated by the FBI, and called domestic terrorists. This must change. That is why I will champion the Parents' Bill of Rights introduced in the last Congress by most members of this committee, led by Julia Letlow of Louisiana. This legislation will protect the right of parents to know what their children is child is being taught in the classroom as well as their right to be heard. It's time for the education complex to understand that children belong to their parents, not the state. Extending education freedom to more students will also be one of my top priorities, as it has been since I came to Congress. And I'm pleased to see more parents taking their child's education into their own hands since the pandemic. There's been a surge in the creation of micro schools, home school, co-ops, and other innovative forms of education. There's also been a surge in enrollment in charter schools and private schools. This is a good thing. More competition and disruption in the modern education system means all schools will have greater incentives to serve their students well. I'm hopeful that this is a topic Republicans and Democrats can work on together, as I know we all want what is best for students. I'll also be working to protect the integrity of Title IX. We must maintain a level playing field for women and girls in sports. This is no game. Many opportunities for girls and women hinge on their participation in sports. Allowing men to take the place of women on sports teams erodes decades of accomplishment and deprives women of these opportunities. Post-secondary education needs just as much transformation as K-12 education. Yet the Biden administration is turning our student loan system on its head. Instead of addressing problems like the rising cost of college and poor student outcomes, Republicans will not stand by while the Biden administration attempts to enact its retroactive free college agenda. As the institution that holds the power of the purse, we have a responsibility to protect the interest of taxpayers and ensure that students are receiving a high quality education that enables them to repay their loans and be career ready. Republicans plan to pass common sense legislation that fixes the inherent problems in our federal student loan and accountability systems to protect both federal student loan and to protect, pardon me, uh, both borrowers and taxpayers. 
You will also hear about the necessity for college cost transparency and innovation here today. We have a tremendous opportunity to advance bold post-secondary education solutions. Finally, Republicans will also work to improve our nation's workforce development programs and ensure they are delivering the skill development opportunities that workers seek and employers demand. We recognize that a baccalaureate degree is not the appropriate or necessary path for everyone, and we must support all pathways to achieving the American dream. Once again, welcome to all new and returning members. I look forward to working with you. Let's make this a productive Congress. I now recognize the distinguished ranking member for the purpose of making an opening statement. Uh, good morning and thank you, Dr. Fox. When the Supreme Court decided the Brown v. Board of Education decision in 1954, it outlawed legal discrimination in education and said, among other things, that in these days, this is doubtful that any child may reasonably be expected to succeed in life if denied the opportunity of an education. Such an opportunity, where the state has undertaken to provide it, is a right which must be made available to all on equal terms. The court arrived at that opinion in the context of racial segregation, but in fact, their analysis was clear. Access to a quality education is a right, and politics should never prevent a student from receiving a high-quality education. Yet in recent years, Republican politicians have turned our students' classroom into the epicenter of the culture wars. The outset of the COVID-19 pandemic, Republican politicians sought to force schools to reopen classrooms for full-time in-person instruction, regardless of whether it was safe or not. Then in 2021, despite schools and institutions' clear need for additional relief of funding, the Republican lawmakers did nothing to meaningfully help them reopen safely or help students recover from the pandemic. In fact, every congressional Republican voted against the American Rescue Plan, which Democrats passed to provide uh, funding to make it actually possible to open the school safely, keep them open safely, and to make up for lost learning. Of course, academic scores have been down. Students were out of school for a year, maybe even more. And the American Rescue Plan provided the resources to open safely and make sure that we could make up for lost learning with things like after-school programs, summer programs, counselors, and tutors. Those cost money, and the American Rescue Plan provided that money. Now, instead of working with Democrats to address the real issues in schools and institutions, uh, Republican lawmakers are prioritizing culture wars and investigations. In fact, a number of bills introduced across the country to restrict teaching about certain topics or educational gag orders increased in 2022 by 250 percent compared to 2021. Several Republican-led states advance uh, anti-LGBTQ bills like Florida's Don't Say Gay bill, uh, one CEO uh, said that the LGBT youth suicide and crisis prevention uh, organ who, led, who leads uh, youth suicide and crisis prevention organization said that these bills only add to existing stigma and discrimination, which puts these young people at greater risk of bullying, depression, and even suicide. Republican politicians have also supported and implemented policies to ban books censor curriculum and textbooks at every level of learning and punish teachers for accurately recounting our nation's history. Worse, we've seen the proliferation of verbal and physical threats at typically tedious school board meetings. Florida adopted the so-called individual freedom measure, which banned educators from teaching certain topics related to race. In my home state, the governor established an emergency hotline regarding the teacher teaching of critical race theory in K through 12. That dedicated phone line was shut down since there were no complaints about CRT being taught in elementary and secondary schools, and that's maybe because it's only taught in a few law schools. Educational gag orders are a distraction and do not address the public's concerns about the academic success and well-being of American students. Many of these attacks have been launched under the guise of transparency and expanded parents' rights. And while parental engagement is critical for a student's success, Bills introduced have been craft crafted to give a vocal minority the power to impose personal beliefs over all students. Even worse, Republican politicians are holding educators hostages, uh, holding 
educators hostage by forcing them to choose between extremist views or fully funded classrooms. For example, in K through 12 schools in South Carolina and Tennessee, Republican lawmakers passed legislation to withhold badly needed funding from schools because of their curriculum. Slashing support for students has not stopped there. Republicans Attorney General, Republican Attorneys General are suing to prevent over 40 million eligible student loan borrowers from accessing student loan relief while correctional Republicans are simultaneously introducing legislation that would make severe cuts to programs that help students afford a college degree. Congressional Republicans are also opposing the expansion of registered apprenticeship programs, our most successful workforce development program. And we know that 93 percent of apprentices who complete a registered apprenticeship retain employment with an average salary of $77,000. One recent study found that for every dollar business invests in the registered apprenticeship program, they earn a dollar and 44 cents back. These programs are a win-win for workers and businesses, and yet we're ignoring the effectiveness of registered apprenticeships and advocate a diversion of funding to untested models called industry-recognized apprenticeship programs, or IRAPs. IRAPs do not have the guaranteed quality and national recognition that registered apprenticeships have. This Congress, Congressional Democrats, plan to reintroduce legislation to help every student reach his or her full potential. First, the Rebuild America Schools Act and Strengths and Diversity Act and the Equity and Inclusion Enforcement Act will help modernize healthy school buildings so students can learn safety, eliminate inequities in education, and provide families with a legal remedy for students to address disparities in education. Lowering obstacles to achievement now, uh, now act, the Loan Act, will ensure that all Americans can access, uh, can have more access to affordable higher education. The Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act and the National Apprenticeship Act will fully, will fully fund evidence-based job training and apprenticeship programs to prepare individuals for our modern economy. These legislative priorities are rooted in evidence and research and will take into account the real concerns facing students, parents, educators, and communities. I hope my colleagues on the committee will stop putting, will, will put, um, stop putting politics over people and put people over politics and join Democrats in addressing the most pressing issues facing our nation's students. And with that, um, Madam Chair, I yield back. Uh, thank you, Representative Scott. Without objection, all other members who wish to insert written statements into the record may do so by submitting them to the committee clerk electronically in Microsoft Word format by 5 p.m., 14 days after the day of this hearing, February 22, 2023. I'll now introduce our witnesses uh, Virgin Ms. Virginia Gentles is the director of the Education Freedom Center with the Independent Women's Forum. Dr. Monty Sullivan. Dr. Monty Sullivan is the president of Louisiana Community and Technical College System located in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Mr. Jared Polis. Mr. Polis is the governor of Colorado and a former colleague who served admirably on this committee. And for our final witness, I yield to Representative Owens for the introduction. Thank you, Chairman, Chairwoman Fox. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to this committee Mr. Scott Pulsifer, President of Western Governors University, WGU, headquartered in my district in Salt Lake City, Utah. After more than 20 years in the private sector, Mr. Pulsifer came to WGU in 2016 has proven himself to be a game changer in the post-secondary education. WG, WGU is the world, is nation's first and largest competency-based university, and under its leadership, an institution has continued to drive innovation to improve students' outcomes in Utah and across the country. Thank you, Mr. Pulsifer, for coming for this committee. I look forward to hearing from you today. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Owens. We thank all of our witnesses for being here today and look forward to your testimony. Let me remind the witnesses that we've read your written statements and they will appear in full in the hearing record. Pursuant to Committee Rule 8D and committee practice, each of you is asked to limit your oral presentation to a five-minute summary of your written statement. 
The witnesses are aware of their responsibility to provide accurate information to the subcommittee, and therefore, we will proceed with their testimony. Before you begin your testimony, please remember to press the button on the microphone in front of you so that it will turn on and the members can hear you. As you begin to speak, the light in front of you will turn green. After four minutes, the light will turn yellow to signal that you have one minute remaining. When the light turns red, your five minutes have expired, and we ask that you please wrap up. Also, as long-standing committee practice, we'll let the entire panel make their presentations before we move to member questions. When answering a question, please remember once again to turn your microphone on and then off once finished. I will first recognize Ms. Gentles. Chairwoman Fox, Ranking Member Scott, and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to appear today. My name is Virginia Gentles. I'm the mother of two school-aged children and the director of the Education Freedom Center at Independent Women's Forum. Before I delve into the significant challenges our students, teachers, and families are facing, I want to highlight two positive developments, and the first is the expansion of education freedom. Iowa and Utah passed laws last month creating K-12 education savings account programs. And last year, Arizona established the gold standard for educational freedom by expanding eligibility for the state's existing ESA programs to cover all 1.1 million Arizona students. Second, policymakers are acknowledging the widespread failure of balanced literacy reading programs and starting to require phonics-based reading instruction. As legislators who regularly hear from distraught parents, you are familiar with the bad news. We're faced with alarming learning loss, fueled by the potent combination of COVID-era school closures and the prioritization of activism over academic instruction. Pervasive discipline and mental health issues that are creating an unsafe environment for teachers and students. School systems that are determined to view parents as the enemy. And powerful teachers unions and education bureaucrats that reject transparency yet relentlessly demand more funding. We must acknowledge the pernicious influence of teachers unions. These powerful organizations seek to expand their partisan political influence and control working conditions. They do not aspire to improve education. Union roadblocks appeared at the outset of the COVID era school closures and they continued into 2021 with leaders colluding with the CDC to, to draft restrictive reopening guidance. Union leaders and union supported school board members cannot and should not escape accountability for the learning loss crisis they exacerbated. Fourth and eighth grade math and reading scores on the 2022 nation's report card significantly dropped since students were last tested in 2019. Only one quarter of eighth grade students met math proficiency standards. Chaotic classrooms are driving talented teachers to quit, likely accelerating learning loss. According to federal data, schools are plagued with chronic absenteeism, a significant increase in behavioral issues, and increase in verbal abuse and disrespect towards teachers. School districts' excessively lenient discipline policies leave teachers without the tools that they need to address these challenges. In theory, mental health support could help children, but many parents are concerned that the con about the consequences of funneling more money into school counselors that are represented by an association that embraces radical ideologies. Unfortunately, too many forces within the education system insist on prioritizing the promotion of ideologies over academic instruction. Polls consistently reveal that most people don't want children to be bombarded with activist drafted materials and lessons and books that are pushing radical gender ideology and instructing young children that they can be born in the wrong body. School policies that secretly transition children, hiding their new names, identities, and bathroom, locker room, and overnight trip accommodations from parents through gender support plans are based on the assumption that the only acceptable response to children who ex express a desire for a new name and, and identity is immediate and unquestioning affirmation. School staff are pushing highly sensitive girls, regardless of their mental health struggles, down a one-way path to medical transition. And school staff who do not adhere to this radical belief system are punished. School districts are citing non-existent Title IX requirements as the pretext for hiding information from parents. This must stop. Congress can address one Title IX issue by supporting Congressman Greg Stubbe's Protection of Women and Girls in Sports Act, which will end the practice of allowing biological males to take awards, roster spots, and scholarship from female athletes. Parents deserve power over their children's education, but education bureaucrats and unions hold all the power in states without education freedom. Supporting the Parents' Bill of Rights Act, introduced by Representative Julia Letlow, will acknowledge parents' fundamental rights and the importance of curriculum, budget, and student record transparency. 
Schools, uh, students must be allowed to escape the residentially assigned public schools that are not effectively educating them. The Educational Choice for Children's Act will create a K-12 federal scholarship tax credit and give parents the purchasing power to pay for tuition, tutoring, or technology. It's time for funding to follow the child to the education option that best meets, meets his or her needs. Leaders of the public K-12 education system continue to demand funding increases, but the federal government already provided more than $190 billion in emergency supplemental education funding, primarily in the form of uh, elementary and secondary school emergency or relief, or ESSER funds. The money was largely not needed or used to facilitate school reopening, and many districts have not yet spent the funds. I'm the mother of a sixth and a ninth grader, so I have a front row seat to the failures of our educational system. We need legislators to hold the K-12 cartel accountable for the learning loss crisis it created and pass legislation that provides families with educational transparency and freedom. Thank you. Thank you very much for being right on time. We'll now hear from Dr. Sullivan. Good morning, Chairwoman Fox, Ranking Member Scott, and members of the committee. I'm Monty Sullivan, President of the Louisiana Community and Technical College System, uh, and also President of Rebuilding America's Middle Class, a national coalition of state and individual community college systems. On behalf of Louisiana's 12 two-year institutions and the more than 150,000 students that we serve annually, as well as Ramsey, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. With each information cycle and technological advancement, the skill requirements of the workplace are ever increasing. We're already far behind, as reflected in our nation's near record 11 million unfilled jobs. Louisiana leads the nation in this category with unfilled vacancies. At the same time, we have people sitting on the sidelines who want to work, but have not yet obtained the education skills needed to participate in the modern economy. The United States labor force participation rate was 62.4% in January. That is down from 67% two decades ago. We have far too many people on the sidelines not participating in the economy. The market for talent is exceptionally tight and seems to be growing tighter by the day. Central to this policy must be the recognition that almost every good job in America requires participation beyond high school, perhaps college, perhaps on the job skills, but beyond high school. With that perspective, the following are recommendations to the committee. First and foremost, expand Pell Grants to cover short-term workforce programs. The single most important step Congress can take on behalf of the 60 million Americans with a high school diploma or less, let that sink in, is to authorize the use of Pell Grants for workforce programs. Students need the shortest and least expensive pathway to employment and opportunity for advancement throughout their lives. In the last three years, our community, and our community colleges in Louisiana have served over 15,000 students who graduated with these credentials. Students completed these programs have strong job placement rates above 90% and have a demonstrated wage improvement of well over 20% from uh, the prior year. More broadly in Louisiana, we have a recognized uh, earnings premium for our students who complete short-term workforce programs that is greater than the initial earnings of those students who gain credentials from credit-based programs that are Pell eligible. Clearly, these short-term credentials are demonstrating value to employers. Yet, these shorter-term programs are reserved for those who have money in their pockets and will not require Pell Grants to attend college. Effectively, we're limiting the ability of a broad swath of Americans to quickly gain the skills needed to obtain a good job. I congratulate you, Chairwoman Fox, along with Representative Stefanik, uh, Banks, Henson, and Thompson for your vision in bringing forward the Promoting Employment and Lifelong Learning Act, which Ramsey has endorsed. I also appreciate the several other efforts in Congress to expand Pell Grants for short-term programs and strongly urge Congress to come to an ex a consensus on this issue. Point two, update and improve WIOA. Under the Workforce Innov Innovation and Opportunity Act, Louisiana has 15 workforce development areas, each with its own local board led by a business representative. Collectively in program year ending 2022, Louisiana serves 5,655 individuals in quote, training services which places Louisiana above the national average, but yet it pales in comparison to the 180,000 vacancies that we have in Louisiana. We simply cannot get to the goal continuing down the path we're on today. The following are recommendations that I would make to you around WIOA. First and foremost, require more WIOA funds to be targeted toward workforce training accounts. Improve coordination with the Higher Education Act. 
Individuals do not understand the difference between federal policy and WIOA and Higher Education Act. Streamline those processes. Maintain the requirement for state and local boards to be led by businesses. Allow for more flexibility in establishing enhanced accountability systems with providers and provide better labor market information. And finally, strengthen the role of community colleges as we think about the development and the growth of our workforce system. Point three, we must establish a no wrong door approach to education and workforce attainment. While the effort is intended to lower and eliminate barriers to access education and employment, current policies too often place the highest barriers in front of those with the greatest need. Point four, and the final point, developing America's talent is, response, is the responsibility of the education system, but also business partners. But they cannot do it alone. We have great examples in Louisiana business partnerships. Our friends at General Dynamics IT are located on the campus of Bossier Parish Community College with an, over 1,000 employees right there on the college campus. In the New Orleans market, our Mechatronics Apprenticeship Program brings together three LCTCS colleges to meet the needs of the greater uh, manufacturing sector. In closing, I'd like to thank you again for the opportunity to share some thoughts with you today. Education is indeed the antidote to the ills of this nation. We know that our people and our economy will be more resilient, dynamic, and future ready if we can free ourselves from historical uh, structures and reconceptualize these systems for the modern world. Can you imagine, can you imagine in America where every single household has one college credential or industry-based certification that supports that household. I can imagine that America. Together we can get there. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. I now recognize Governor Polis and a former member of this committee, as I said, for his um, comments. Good morning, uh, Chairwoman Fox, Ranking Member Scott. It's, while it's good to be under the watchful gaze of Chair Conyers and, and Chair Goodlot, I hope you return to your committee room soon and wish you luck. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify on the state of education. Today, our country truly does face an education crisis, a crisis in quality, equity, access, and affordability. And as leaders, we need to do what we can to strengthen our schools, create inclusive settings where all students can learn, empower our educators, parents, and school leaders to prepare every learner for success. That starts with strong early childhood education. Colorado's made incredible progress with free full-day kindergarten for every child, and now new free universal preschool, which launches this fall, which will save families $6,000 per year and prepare students for success. While the pandemic brought forward significant challenges, we saw teachers, students, parents, school districts, higher ed, and businesses step up in new and innovative ways. We also saw major federal investments from COVID relief funds provided through the Elementary and Secondary Education Relief, or ESSER funds, and the Governor's Emergency Education Relief, or GEAR funds, that are already making a difference. In Colorado, we use the lion's share of our ESSER funds to address learning loss, like starting the Colorado High Impact Tutoring Program, which offered 43,000 hours of tutoring to 3,800 students in its first semester. We've invested GEAR money to create the RISE Education Fund, to invest in creative, locally driven solutions to improve student achievement and close achievement gaps in innovative ways, like the creation of a mobile learning center that brings resources, internet, and learning opportunities directly to students in mountainous Lake County, Colorado. We also created the Governor's Bright Spot Award to recognize the 21 Colorado schools that improved student performance two bands or more on our state accountability system since the pandemic began like Rocky Mountain Elementary School and St. Frain Valley School District that implemented high quality, hybrid learning, provided a no cost summer program that offered evidence-based literacy and math instruction and improved greatly results over the last two years. We saw similar innovations across states like Indiana's Explore, Engage, and Experience grant program that allows students to test out potential career pathways and Washington's Reimagine Education Project which integrates social and emotional learning into alternative learning structures. We're also focused on supporting the mental health needs of learners, including through critical mental health supports like iMatter, an American Rescue Plan funded program that now offers six free counseling sessions to all students in Colorado. We also continue to graduate more high school students with post-secondary credit, work skills, and credentials. 53% of graduating Colorado students took a dual and concurrent enrollment course, and we want to grow that number. Colorado is also home to CareerWise, which now supports thousands of youth apprentices in not just Colorado, but Indiana, New York, DC, and Michigan. 
By blurring the lines between high school and higher education, we can save students money, help them gain skills, and set them up to successfully uh, navigate life. As we do that, we need to make higher education more affordable and accessible. In Colorado, we've held tuition rates to lower than inflation for the last few years, and we launched the Zero Textbook Challenge, which encourages Colorado institutions to expand the use of open educational resources and eliminate textbook costs. I also want to applaud the Biden administration's effort to increase Pell Grant funding. But it's not only about affordability. It's also about insurance, in, ensuring students get a real return on investment, holding schools accountable, and protecting students from predatory practices. We need transparency so students can make informed decisions about where to spend their hard-earned time and money. All of this work is to ensure that every student can get skills and knowledge to find a job that supports them and their family and meets the needs of our business community. In Colorado, we have two open jobs for every unemployed person, which is why we're working to expand training opportunities in new and innovative ways. For instance, we're now providing free community and technical college for students pursuing careers in healthcare with the hope of expanding this to construction, firefighting, law enforcement, nursing, and early childhood education. 1,000 students were trained and entered the workforce within the first three months of this program. We're also in the process of expanding registered apprenticeship opportunities, and we created a first-of-its-kind opportunity in the health sector that integrates AmeriCorps and registered apprenticeships. I encourage Congress to reauthorize WIOA so the states can continue directing key WIOA investments towards each state's unique in-demand workforce needs, including flexibility for key wraparound services like transportation and childcare so people can get to work. Through all this work, states are leading the charge on innovative ways to support students and workers of all ages. We need to be bold and continue pursuing new and innovative ways to prepare all Americans for success. Let's turn this crisis into action. Many states see this as an opportunity to move forward and innovate, and I'm hopeful that Congress can use this momentum to improve quality, equity, access, and affordability across education. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and finally, we'll hear from Mr. Pulsifer. Chairwoman Fox, Ranking Member Scott, and members of the committee, I'm grateful for your convening this hearing and for the opportunity to offer a perspective on the state of higher education. WGU is a private nonprofit institution founded in 1997 by a bipartisan group of 19 governors who saw the opportunity to leverage technology and competency-based education to improve access, quality, and outcomes in higher education. Our mission is to change lives for the better by creating pathways to opportunity. Today, we serve more than 200,000 students and graduate 45 to 50,000 during an academic year, two-thirds of whom belong to one or more historically underserved populations. The challenges plaguing our higher education system are many and complex, to which our best response will be guided by this simple principle, creating value for students. This became abundantly clear when attending my first WGU commencement as graduates shared the journeys they took and the hurdles they overcame to achieve their degrees. Many were in their 30s and often accompanied by both parents and children. Reflecting upon this and the nearly 50 commencements since, it's clear that for many, education is far more meaningful than a coming of age experience or some external validation. It is a gateway to a better life for themselves and their families. That is the promise we all should expect of higher education. This is not to diminish the role of research universities nor imply that the purpose of higher education should be reduced to job training. Nor is it to force trade-off between advancing citizenry or career enablement as both are fundamental for the well-being of well-functioning individuals and society. But I would argue that the challenges today center primarily around the growing failure to live up to education's promise as a great equalizer. Indeed, data show our most vulnerable students are disproportionately likely to leave college with considerable debt and no degree, or at least one that took far more than four years to earn. And post-college earnings for low-income students are generally lower than those of their wealthier peers. Over the last 50 years, while completion for those from the top income quartile has increased from 40 to 62%, for their peers from the bottom income quartile, it has barely risen from 6 to 13%. We are leaving too much talent on the table and paying dearly for it, both in skyrocketing costs and in persisting workforce gaps. Policymakers have worked to mitigate the risks that students experience from a poor return on investment. But instead of triaging a flawed system with well-intentioned but short-sighted solutions, we need to address the root problem. Higher education has been engineered beyond its primary objective enabling economic and social mobility for its students. Institutions contend with competing priorities, established budget mechanisms, and conflicting incentives that can favor selectivity, constrain enrollment, drive up costs, and propagate outdated models. 
layer in regulatory prescription and cultural nostalgia, and change becomes challenging to the point of impossible. WGU was founded and designed to, to better serve those poorly served, underserved, or not served at all by conventional options with a focus on access and outcomes. 26 years later, WGU has graduated more than 300,000 individuals who are employed at rates at or above national averages with income gains one-third higher and who, who report higher levels of engagement in their jobs and in overall well-being. Many aspects of WGU are unique, but our success in serving students need not be. Congress can promote greater clarity of purpose and expectations in higher education, whereas much of current policy is left it highly regulated as to process and unaccountable as to student outcomes. Safeguards are certainly needed, but safeguards that regulate inputs mostly reinforce convention and constrain innovation that holds the promise of enabling the very outcomes that safeguards intend to secure. Congress can help flip this paradigm with an emphasis toward enabling innovation with accountability, particularly in access. Enabling the future workforce starts with dramatically expanding enrollment. And never before have we had such powerful tools as technology, the internet, and new models of learning, including competency-based education. Relevancy, ensuring credentials and earned and skills gained keep pace with the future of work. And new credentials and pathways can be developed appropriately sized and timed to an individual's career development and workforce needs. Costs and value, improving affordability by incentivizing lower costs and better choices rather than how to pay for ever increasing costs, and holding institutions and students for credential attainment and value. Ultimately, outcomes are paramount, as access without attainment is an empty, is an empty promise, especially when underwritten by the taxpayer and when students hold the debt. Quality is not a matter of mode, method, or model, but completion and value for students. It is much a moral hazard to fund access without completion as it is to achieve high completion rates by precluding access. With the proper incentives in place, Congress can help reinvent a system that is accessible, affordable, completable, and relevant to opportunities and workforce needs. Most importantly, we can dispel the disheartening claim repeated by far too many that college is not for me. Education is and must be for everyone, both for the sake of the individual and our whole society. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I now yield to the committee. Uh, again, thank you all very much for your very enlightening comments. Under committee rule 9A, we'll now question witnesses under the five-minute rule. I'll wait to ask my questions and therefore recognize Mr. Wilson from South Carolina for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and best wishes on your uh, service as chairman. We're just uh, so happy to have you. And thank, thank you, you uh, to our witnesses being here today. Uh, it's especially uh, good to see an alumnus of uh, college, uh, Governor Polis, uh, although he's giving it away and violating union work rules with the big smile he has. He indicates he's happy to be here, but he can't wait to get home. So, <laughs> and so best wishes on your service. Um, Mr. Gentles, uh, it's, uh, you have cited what's uh, going right in American education. You call Arizona the gold standard for education freedom after the passage of the universal school choice bill last year. Can you explain how the law works and how you consider it the gold standard? Yes, so Arizona has had a program called Empowerment Scholarship Accounts in place for over 10 years, and these provide uh, state-created um, savings accounts that can be used for eligible education purposes for K-12. And so these can be uh, tuition, but also tutoring, therapies, textbooks, and if the funds are left over, they can be even rolled over and used for, for college. The, the program was expanded for universal eligibility, setting a model for other education savings accounts in the country. There are over 10 states with, with these programs now, and we, we think that this is the, the future because it offers control, freedom, and flexibility for parents. Well, it's, it's really a great model for the rest of the country. Congratulations. Uh, Dr. Sullivan, you discussed how the rapid developments of technology are increasing skill demands in the modern workforce. I'm really grateful in my home state of South Carolina, we've been promoting uh, technology. Uh, it has resulted in my hometown of Lexington, South Carolina, the largest Michelin tire company to, uh, corporation uh, investment in the world. Additionally, it's uh, led uh, to our state now being the leading manufacturer and exporter of tires of any state union, and then uh, with success in our state uh, with Governor Carol Campbell of BMW, uh, we're now the leading, uh, with Volvo and Mercedes Sprinter Vans now, we're the leading exporter of cars. 
uh, but it's due to uh, te the technology and the technical schools uh, that we have that have made this possible. Uh, with the development of workforce development system, it has to evolve. How can the workforce system better embrace technological innovations to increase efficiency and improve the services available to job seekers? Thank you, Mr. Wilson, and, and congratulations to South Carolina on an incredible, uh, uh, great work that you have done. We have been on the other end of some of those competitions that, uh, that you won, and uh, we're, we're very proud to see the progress going on in South Carolina, and great uh, work by your community and technical college system there to make sure that the state of, of South Carolina has the, the workforce talent that they need in order to be able to support those businesses once they arrive. Uh, it's important to note that uh, I mentioned 60 million adults in this economy with a high school diploma or, or less. Each year in the state of Louisiana, we graduate about 40,000 kids from high school a year. But yet we have 1.1 million working age adults who have a high school diploma or less. Oftentimes, they're the same parents to the young people that we were just describing. And so from, from our perspective, we must build in continuous opportunities for on-ramp, uh, in, for individuals to get into education, short-term training to get the, the uh, education that they need to be uh, able to take on that first job, but then also a great relationship with the employers like the ones that you mentioned to help advance the, the education of that individual so they understand the technology. Thank you very much. And hey, we enjoy our competition with you, but it's not fair when you bring people uh, to Mardi Gras season. Uh, it has an uh, unfair advantage. Uh, and. Uh, Mr. Pulsford, uh, you were going through the Western Governors University's uh, Responsible uh, Borrowing Initiative. Can you go through it uh, uh, even further? Uh, how does this benefit students? Yeah, thank you for that uh, question, Representative Wilson. The Responsible Borrowing Initiative is simply based upon the principle that if you give information, if you give better information to individuals, they make better choices. And so what we do is we actually expose to our individuals what the total cost of attending and completing their degree will be at WGU and make recommendations to them as to how much they should borrow. What we've actually found is that, you know, fully two-thirds of the students who uh, actually follow that recommendation, and another five to 10% end up actually choosing no federal aid whatsoever. What that has allowed WGU graduates to uh, achieve is, is that we've reduced the borrowing by 30% in terms of debt per graduate has declined by 30% since the, re the Responsible Borrowing Initiative, and we've actually also reduced the total number of students who are, who are attending WGU and their actual use of financial aid to do so. Well, thank each of you for coming. And again, Governor, we're happy to have you here. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. And um, now I recognize Ms. Wilson um, for the purpose of questioning the witnesses. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Fox and Ranking Member Scott for convening today's hearing. Last night during his State of the Union address, President Biden said, let's give public school teachers a raise. They deserve a raise. And everyone in the chamber gave a standing ovation. Everyone on both sides. I couldn't agree more. Later today, I'm introducing a bill with Mr. Bowman and with the vast majority of the Democrats on this committee to do just that, the American Teacher Act. The American Teacher Act sets a $60,000 minimum teacher salary nationwide and provides a cost of living adjustment for teachers making above $60,000. Low teacher pay is one of the many factors contributing to teacher shortages across the nation. Chairwoman Fox got it right. Our education system is in fact in crisis. We have thousands of unstaffed classrooms partly because of low teacher wages. As a former Miami-Dade County teacher, principal, and school board member, promoting the vitality of our nation's education system is my top priority. I see the struggle to recover from COVID-19 pandemic in my community every day, from elementary school classrooms to college lecture halls. That's why Democrats put a plan forward to help our schools during the 117th Congress. In Miami-Dade County Public Schools, even with federal support, officials are still grappling with teacher shortages amidst a growing migrant population in the region. A recent report from Broward County Schools revealed a disturbing increase in behavioral incidents connected to COVID-related trauma and stress. Despite these challenges, my Republican colleagues have decided 
to weaponize their newfound majority to politicize American education. Proposed Republican reforms, including the Parents' Bill of Rights, are nothing more than political posturing. These proposals are nothing more than an appeal to the most radical sectors of our nation. They fail to address the needs of students and staff across the education spectrum, leaving them ill-equipped and underprepared for a post-pandemic economy. The Democratic members of this committee are here to continue the work we started in the 117th Congress with one goal in mind, strengthen our education system. Remember, this is only the beginning. Democrats will stay the course. We will fight this right-wing extremist agenda. Our amazing students, teachers, college professors, school personnel, and parents deserve nothing less. With that, I have a few questions. Welcome back, Governor Polis. I sat next to you on this committee. You said in your testimony that we are in a crisis of equity and access to higher education, and I agree. A large component of that is cost. The cost of a higher education degree has skyrocketed, and students have become saddled with debt. I am pleased that the Biden administration has taken significant efforts to address this crisis, including one-time debt relief, changes to the income-driven driv repayment program, and changes to public service loan forgiveness program. Unfortunately, my colleagues have slammed th these efforts as a backdoor scheme from the Democrats, but uh, I believe these are necessary to fix a broken loan system. Why are these administrative actions necessary for borrowers, and what can Congress do to build on the administration's work to address some of the biggest issues with the loan system? Thank you, Representative Wilson. Um, the, the cost of a college education has rendered it less accessible now rather than more accessible for many Americans. Um, it's increased at a higher rate than inflation for much of the last several decades. Uh, we're grateful for uh, federal programs that are able to help students meet the cost and break down those barriers. Those include Pell Grants, um, and I'm very supportive of the Biden administration efforts to increase Pell Grants, uh, as well as efforts to support innovation and excellence. Um, this work of making sure that we align investment to outcomes and making sure that students receive value for the education they get is also important. It's important to look at the cost and at the same time to look at the benefit and make sure that in the investments that the federal government is making, as well as we're doing this in Colorado with our state investments, make sure that the benefits uh, exceed the costs of the investment that we're making in helping students achieve success. Thank you very much. I now, introduce, uh, now uh, recognize Mr. Wahlberg for, from Michigan for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks to the panel for being here, including our colleague, who's still our colleague, just on a different committee. One of the biggest drivers of the cost of higher education is the fact that graduate students have no limit on borrowing. Yet studies show many master's degrees do not have an equal return on investment. In fact, one study found approximately 40% provided a negative return on investment. Mr. Pulsifer. Uh, you mentioned in your testimony that your institution has focused on delivering a valuable education to its students by focusing on degrees and certifications that lead to in-demand careers. That's interesting. Uh, while keeping costs low uh, for students, that's interesting as well. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more uh, on how you create these programs specifically while keeping the costs low? Yeah, thank you for that question, Representative Wahlberg. Um, we start with the fundamental principle that education has to be a path to opportunity. And so we start from that opportunity and work backwards, if you will. Um, we actually directly uh, identify those skills and, and requirements that are needed in the workforce, particularly the future workforce. That can come from partnerships with a company called Lightcast, who can actually do a great library and catalog of all the skills that are needed. But once we identify kind of macro demand out there, we then start working directly with employers and associations that represent that topical or kind of that field of study and domain of expertise, such that we're gaining the, that input directly into the design and development of our curriculum so that we know that fundamentally that when our, grad, when our students complete those programs, that they're actually ready to possess the skills and competencies 
that are needed to be successful in the workforce. This is why 98% of our employers are hiring WG graduates again, and they rate them as highly skilled or highly prepared for the workforce, as do the students and graduates themselves. Now, as it relates to making it affordable, we have something that addresses both the tuition and the cost of completing the program, but also can accelerate the time to complete it. Uh, we simply, one, first and foremost, keep our tuition costs at under $4,000 for a bachelor's degree per a six-month term. But for the competency-based approach, it actually allows individuals to go at a pace that's right for them, such that in that six months, students can complete as many courses as they are able we do not track seat time in the course. What we track is competency to that, such that on average our bachelor's degrees are completing, our graduates of bachelor's degrees are completing in two and a half years at a cost of less than $20,000 total. Well, that's the savings. If it produces the quality, and you've indicated that it has by a result of what the employers are saying, I appreciate that. Um, let me move on another track, uh, parental involvement in the education of their children, and I see that as good. With all due respect, I uh, don't see that as uh, anything other than how it ought to be. It's, it's, a, it's a paramount to a student's success. However, in recent years, we've seen a push by teachers' unions and school districts, sadly, to exclude parents from the education of their children. This is why I recently introduced the Protect Kids Act with Senator Tim Scott. Uh, Ms. Gentles. You noted in your written testimony the harmful impacts of ideological indoctrination in some of our schools, especially on young children. Uh, do you believe this is driving a wedge between parents and their own children? Well, absolutely, and it's designed to. The, the idea of, of telling children that their it's parents... It's designed to? Yes, when we're talking about gender ideology specifically, uh, there's a, an intention there to tell, tell children things that are biologically false, that uh, a child could be born in the wrong body or a child might be born a boy, a girl, both or neither, and then uh, instruct the child that if their parent questions them on this, if they bring that information home, that their parent is a bigot and that their parent is hateful and, that and if the child chooses to choose one of the 70 plus gender identities that are taught in school, that, uh, and if the parent questions that, then the parent must want them dead. Uh, there's a lot uh, that's always pushed out there about suicide, or the parent will kick them out. Uh, the, the child will be homeless. So there's, a, there, there's absolutely a, a wedge that's being, being driven. And then when we talk about gender support plans, that's intentionally hiding information. So it creates a secret between the, 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 school, the, the school and the child that they're keeping from the parent. That's a very clear wedge. Yeah, whether well, there's a disagreement or not, to keep secrets causes great concerns. Would you say that it would be um, important then if schools do this intentionally, uh, keeping those secrets, they should lose their federal funding? Actions have to be taken. It has to be sent in a very clear message to districts that and, and to schools that this is not acceptable. And so we see state legislation that's addressing this, and I understand that you and Senator Scott have introduced legislation as well. Those messages have to be sent very clearly that gender support plans, keeping secrets from parents, pushing children down a path to, to medical transition must stop. Thank it must you. be a consequence. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Ms. Bonamici, I now recognize you for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chair Fox and Ranking Member Scott. I want to start by expressing my strong opposition to the notion that the solution to the so-called crisis in American education is to funnel taxpayer dollars to unaccountable private schools and for-profit charter schools. Voucher programs of all types, whether they're traditional vouchers, education savings accounts, or tax credit scholarships, undermine the effectiveness of public education. Research has shown repeatedly that vouchers do not improve student achievement, and when policymakers make a conscious decision to give coupons to certain students to attend private schools, their message to the millions of students still attending public schools is, you don't matter, it's not important to us to equip your school to serve you and all students well. A real crisis in American education is that many of my colleagues in Congress and in state legislatures are applying a device of strategy rooted in discrimination toward and exclusion of LGBTQ students and students with disabilities, trying to censor and silence content that does not fit their political ideology and agenda, defunding public schools, and failing to address gun violence. 
I spent more than 15 years as an active parent volunteer in public schools and an advocate for public education. I was in many schools, many classrooms, and many conversations. We can all agree that parent and family engagement is an instrumental part of creating a safe, inclusive, and supportive public schools environment for all students. And I welcome the opportunity to work with my colleagues on the other side of the aisle to uplift best practices, evidence-based practices, in family engagement, rather than pit parents against their kids, educators, and schools. So Governor Polis, it's great to see you. Welcome back. I'm grateful for your leadership in closing the opportunity gap for students in Colorado and in helping students recover lost learning time from the pandemic. You understand that developing a parent and family engagement strategies is a requirement under ESEA for schools receiving federal funding. So I have a two-part question, and this is my first question. Why is it important for educators to authentically and meaningfully engage with parents and families? And how are Colorado's school districts implementing parent and fa family engagement strategies that reach culturally, linguistically, and socioeconomically diverse parents and families, and that support the health and well-being of LGBTQ students? Thank you, Representative Bonamici. Um, involving parents is absolutely critical uh, in success. And when you look at best practices at the site level, uh, principals, school leaders, at the classroom level, teachers, uh, one of the uh, big markers for success is how well parents are included in that process. I've seen school leaders do inventory of skills of parents and find ways that parents can supplement and provide additional learning opportunities for kids at the classroom level, making sure that parents are partners uh, and, and know what their students assigned for homework. A lot of new technologies have enabled uh, more involvement of parents on a regular basis, um, which is absolutely wonderful towards achieving uh, success. Um, we, we do it through conventional structures like PTAs and PTOs, uh, but also at the classroom level in new and innovative ways. When, when you look at the bright spot schools that improved two bands of achievement during the pandemic, which was a very challenging time, uh, every school had their own localized strategy, but one common theme across many of them were successful strategies to involve parents and sometimes even uh, the community at large. Uh, in, in, in the education. We appreciate the federal investment in helping to forge uh, parent, student, teacher partnerships with all learners, including learners from diverse backgrounds, which in a state like Colorado and many states across the country often means you need to look at different languages. Um, when you have parents that speak Spanish or uh, Vietnamese or any other language, uh, and, and you can't always just rely on the student as that translator. Um, it's often too much to put on the shoulders of a third or fourth grader, and also the student themselves might not be fully proficient in both languages. So making sure the schools have access uh, to uh, not just the, the second most language. In our state, we're providing the access in Spanish is relatively easy, but we have elementary schools in Aurora, Colorado, that have 28 languages that parents speak at that school. Yeah, and, and making sure it's and, open. And, and I don't want to cut you off, critical. but I just want to ask you about, yeah. you, you said you, you visited, Chat, uh, is it Chatfield yes. Elementary School? Um, and you can tell when you enter a school, you know, there's a, there's your joy of learning and, uh, you know, the students thriving. So can you tell us a little bit about the visit and elaborate on how COVID relief funds help make improvements uh, possible and help your state focus on uh, professional development? For Chatfield education? Elementary uh, is a, uh, a school in a uh, lower income area of Grand Junction, Colorado, Clifton area. It was in turnaround status, which is our lowest performance status three years ago. Uh, they were able to improve to above average status over three years. So what did they do? Really, of course, as always, the leadership and the team uh, of educators play a key role. They better aligned their classroom practices to the standards. They engaged in extensive professional development. Uh, the ESSER funds were used by the school district to provide literacy coaches and math coaches, and they were able to improve over the last three years to be above average, three bands of performance over the last uh, three years, which is quite remarkable. Thank you so much. I say I'm over time. I yield back. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're forgiven. Uh, Mr. Allen from Georgia, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, yes. Uh, obviously, I thank you, uh, Chairwoman Fox, and thank you to our witnesses. Um, COVID shined a bright light on education in this country, and uh, certainly a, a very bright light on uh, the parents and their choices of what the best educational environment would be like for their children. Uh, in the 12th District of Georgia, we are a proud home of the Heritage Academy, an independent school that offers Christ-centered education and then we have the Dublin City Schools, a rural public school district that has implemented charter systems. 
Dublin City Schools offers the choice between two themed elementary schools for specific learning paths, a science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, or STEAM uh, school, and a leadership, environmental awareness, and public service, or LEAP school. In fact, I was there when the young people uh, recited Stephen Covey's seven uh, habits for success. It was impressive. I didn't, I can't recite those. Uh, but we've clearly seen advantages to school choice uh, in our, our district. And uh, Ms. Gentiles, can you, can you uh, explain some of the barriers that we face as far as uh, school choice that uh, like we have here in our district in Georgia? Well, there's been great expansion of school choice over the last three decades. 45 states have charter school laws. Many states have open enrollment, um, magnet school programs, which provide public school choice. And then, of course, 30, over 30 states have um, 65 or so private school choice programs. So there's a wide array of options out there. And, uh, and there are uh, numerous studies showing that there, there are great benefits, specifically to the private school choice program. 26 out of 29 studies have shown that those programs benefit the public school students around them. So we, we definitely want to overcome any barriers that are there because these are um, beneficial programs. Um, barriers in place seem to be um, myths. There are a lot of myths around school choice. And it, I think it's important for, for people to recognize that what's said is often just a talking point and, and not true. And what needs to happen is that uh, people, especially policymakers, need to talk to the families, often low-income families, who are benefiting from school choice programs and whose lives have been changed, and um, recognize that those myths need to be set aside and those barriers need to be overcome and those policies need to be implemented. Well, in Heritage Academy is an example of a low-income school where their kids are are really uh, rock stars and doing great. Uh, Dr. Sullivan, you mentioned the importance of partnering with employers to prepare students with the right skills. Uh, and, uh, in, the, in our district, uh, Textron Specialized Vehicles, uh, or better known, EasyGo, has partnered with the Richmond County School System to implement the uh, Reaching Potential Through Manufacturing or RPM program to offer on-the-job training and employment opportunities. Really to take uh, kids from uh, low-income uh, neighborhoods and just show them that, uh, you know, the American dream is for everybody. Uh, you know, I come from a business background in construction, and uh, I believe that some skills are best learned through uh, real-world experiences. And I'm proud that the 12th District of Georgia isn't waiting until after high school graduation to give these, to give these kids the tools and the, really the ambition uh, they need to succeed. Can you discuss how these types of partnerships with employers have created work-based learning opportunities for students and how Congress can ensure that work-based learning opportunities are available to job seekers around the country? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Allen. I, I, would, I would just point out that I think we all can agree that working and earning a living sooner rather than later is a good thing. And so ensuring that people are, are in a training program, an education program that also allows them to be able to work and make a living, perhaps it's a registered apprenticeship, perhaps it's an earn while you learn model, but regardless, starting with the business partner uh, and beginning with the end in mind. The end in mind being the skill set that the individual needs in order to be able to go to work in that uh, environment. But it doesn't stop there. That's the beginning. And so as we look at the student population, our average age student is 27. 27, a full decade has passed for many of these students by the time they get to that employment uh, circumstance. And so I would just urge uh, that, that Congress continue down the path of ensuring that it is about the value proposition. Many of the students who show up at our colleges, they only have six, eight, 10 weeks to get in, get the training they need, get out and make a living. But we also have to ensure that they're able to come back, uh, that yeah. they're able to continue that growth along uh, the uh, career path that is going to help them to sustain their families. Well, thank you very much, and uh, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Mr. Ticano, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I have to say I want to express my disappointment that <coughs> extremists are being given a platform uh, to push problematic narratives and misinformation about hypothetical issues in order to spread, in order to spread confusion uh, and distraction. 
It's distressing because the very, very young people that need our protection because they are the ones that are targeted with bullying and harassment. Uh, and as they grow older, even death, they are specifically uh, trans uh, minority individuals are specifically the targets of violent, uh, violent murder. It's now, is more, now, the more, now more than ever it is critical for us to rise up to support not scrutinize trans and queer students. They must be supported by their parents as well. All students deserve to feel safe, comfortable, and supported in their schools so they can focus on their education. Supportive educators, whether they belong to a teacher's union or not, and there are supportive educators who are members of unions and supportive educators who are not, but they are essential. They're an essential resource for young people, especially transgender youth, uh, and queer youth who may feel isolated and unsafe. And with that, I just I want to return back to the substance of why we're here. Um, Governor Polis, welcome back. Um, uh, I, I, I want to focus on uh, just the tremendous uh, resources uh, that provided by both Republicans and Democrats. The CARES Act was a Republican-led act. Uh, the ARP, the ARPA, was, uh, was, was Democratic. Um, to meet the needs of states and school districts to safely reopen. And you mentioned some of the things that uh, you've done with those resources, uh, but I want to drill down on to, to the things that, uh, you know, the pandemic, uh, you know, unfortunately the school closures were a result of a very real response uh, to over a million of our fellow Americans dying. That's a fact. And uh, whether schools should have been opened up earlier, that's a matter of debate, but we need to focus on how we help young people now adjust coming back to schools. Can you tell me uh, what kind of resources have gone into mental health services in high schools and uh, kids that were teenagers that are kept in their homes? Uh, you know, any teenager, regardless of, uh, you know, gender identity or uh, LGBTQ status or whatever, that's a tough time to sort of be cooped up at home. And, but that, tell us about the readjustment that's going on in Colorado schools. First of all, uh I, I think I speak for really all governors to saying we're grateful for the flexibility as well as superintendents that we had. Um, I think we were able to meet local needs in each areas across our state uh, very effectively. Um, and we appreciate that the aid of both CARES and ARPA uh, was allowed to be used to meet the local need rather than a particular program or investment. So in many areas, uh, very simply extended learning time which means free uh, summer academies for learners that are struggling. After school tutoring programs were supported widely with ESSER. Uh, through the gear piece, which we deeply appreciate, we were able to design a program that broke down barriers that existed between school districts and community colleges uh, and other educational entities to support aligned work towards improving student achievement. We were also out of the American Rescue Act funds uh, able to fund the I Matters program, which is providing mental health support. Every Colorado student has access to six free counseling sessions. Uh, one uh, noteworthy aspect is the universality of it. Um, they can be virtual, and they are in many places, areas where otherwise students might not be able to access a mental health care provider or someone to talk to. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Um, Mr. Pulsifer, I've been uh, interested in uh, it's a form of credential creep. I've seen professions, professional sort of certifications, uh, see the academic work you got to do just sort of expand. Uh, physician assistance programs, for example. I had one at my community college uh, that we, you could get a physician's assistance certificate or certification in two years. And often people coming out of the military, uh, they came to the community college just for that reason. But then the accrediting body, the independent accrediting body, said you had to make it a master's program. Um, I'm wondering if there's a way for us to reverse that trend, because um, I'm interested in people being able to get high-paying credentials, uh, but what, what do we really need to do to educate that person? Uh, we would welcome uh, you to take a look at federal involvement around expanding scope of practice so people can practice with the training they have. Uh, we've been very thoughtful about uh, applying uh, a skills-based hiring model to the state. 
uh, as well as expanding the scope of practice for nurse assistants and others so they can practice fully up to their level of training and don't require additional college just for the sake of college. Um, and so we'd welcome uh, increased federal interest in that and we'll look forward to visiting with you offline about that. Oh, okay, I'm, I meant that for, 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 thank you, Governor Polis. I meant that for Ms. Polsford, but my time is running out, and uh, I wish, uh, I, I, I'll talk I'll, to you uh, about I'll, <clears throat> I'll allow Mr. Polsford to answer the question since there was a misunderstanding. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Takano. Thank you, Chairwoman, as well. Um, I think uh, we would have to agree with you on that point, which is uh, that uh, the better we can do to actually design learning outcomes that directly map to the skills that are needed in the workforce, and make sure that, in fact, individuals who are traversing those programs are actually um, uh, assessed against their proficiency against that, that we want to make sure that is more traversal, more traversable, more accessible, and that individuals can actually get into the workforce sooner rather than later. Um, there is certainly, even the bachelor's degree notion itself, this idea that you have to have 120 credits of learning before you're actually ready for the opportunities, like that itself is actually a pretty heavy lift. And we've seen that creep even go up in teacher preparation programs, where it's very difficult to even deliver teacher prep in a four-year program. And that's, that's, being de that's being done by states and, you know, and uh, different bodies in nursing and healthcare and places like that. It's like, and that is troubling as you consider the cost and the uh, readiness of the graduates that we're trying to get through those programs. Thank, thank, thank you, you very much. I, I now recognize uh, uh, Congressman Banks from this great state of Indiana. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank uh, him for his patience. Thank you. Uh, Governor, I used to live in Colorado, always respected you. Long before you were elected to office, uh, you weren't afraid to stand, go against the grain and stand out and talk about education reform, charter schools, school choice, and uh, something I've always, always admired about you. Um, I was the first member of Congress during the pandemic to introduce a bill to keep schools open during the pandemic, and I watched closely what, uh, what was going on in Colorado at the time. Um, you were outspoken as well about keeping our kids in school where they belong, and you took a lot of criticism for it. In fact, back in a press conference in July of 2020, you were quoted saying, I believe we can't interrupt education, we can't sacrifice our future and our children's future just because of the pandemic. You took a lot of heat and criticism for saying that. The teachers' unions uh, howled about it. Uh, the Colorado Education Association expressed their great disappointment in you for saying that. And they were outraged at your decision to keep schools open. Obviously, we learned a lot of lessons during the pandemic, um, but when it comes to keeping our kids in school, do you, feel, do you feel vindicated by that decision looking back? What are some of the lessons that you learned from going against the grain, going against the teachers' union, the criticism of some in the political class to keep our kids in the classroom. Well, well, thank you, and again, congratulations on Indiana's Explore, Engage, and Experience grant uh, funded through the American Rescue Act funds. Uh, it was a difficult situation in that there were multiple constituencies. You had parents, uh, some of whom wanted to send their kids back to school, some of them who were not yet ready to do that and wanted to continue online. You had teachers ready to return to the classroom, eager to return to the classroom. You had other teachers, some of them with pre-existing health conditions that were not. Uh, we tried to work with our school districts as best we could to return in-person instruction. What does that mean? We had a program where we offered, for instance, free masks to every teacher and every student who wanted it as a way to encourage students to and, and classes to return. Uh, the majority of our school districts were back all of the 2020 school year. Uh, like in a lot of states, there were some of the larger municipal districts that took a few more months to fully return to in-person instruction. Uh, but we wanted to be partners uh, with parents, with teachers, with, with school leaders, in what do you need to be able to get back to the classroom so that we can continue to move forward. Uh, you wrote a letter to Education Secretary Cardona last April denouncing changes proposed by the Biden administration of federal rules to make it harder for charter schools to get startup grants. You followed that up with an op-ed in the Washington Post titled, quote, the education department's fix for charter schools is misguided. You made the case for charter schools by saying they're some of the most innovative, accessible, and successful schools in Colorado and across the country and that we should support charter schools and that the Biden administration's effort is undermining the success of charter schools. You know, Governor, I couldn't agree with you more on that. Do you stand by what you wrote in that uh, letter that art and the article in the Washington Post? Charter schools uh, mean different things in different states because the different states have different authorization laws. Um, the lens that I uh, really try to frame this crisis, quality, access, equity, and affordability, done right, 
uh, public charter schools can contribute to quality, to access, to equity, and affordability. Um, while I didn't think that uh, the change in the rules were necessary, I was pleased the Department of Education did incorporate uh, many of the comments that critics like myself included uh, to make the changes more workable to help support new charter schools. What else should the Biden administration do to support charter schools? Um, you know, I would encourage the administration to really lean into innovation in all its forms, as the Obama administration did and the Trump administration did. Uh, and that means whether it's an innovative district program, a charter school, uh, a hybrid type program, uh, we should support excellence and innovation. Um, now that also means, of course, accountability and quality. Uh, it doesn't mean we should be throwing money at programs that don't work, but that key role that the federal government can do is to help to be a catalyst before the schools open and get their funding, and that's really what the charter school innovation grants are meant to do. They, like any public school, they're self-sustaining over time. But before they come online, they often need help, and I think that's a very fruitful area to look at uh, investment around how we can encourage districts and charter schools to innovate. Governor, I have three daughters, you have a daughter. Don't you think it's just, it's unfair that biological boys are allowed to compete against biological girls in sports? Well, my daughter's uh, eight years old. She plays in uh, Little League Baseball in Boulder, Colorado, and it's a co-ed league. It's probably about 10% girls, about 90% boys. Um, uh, and she's every bit as competitive as them, and, and you know some of the girls want to be on the same team, and so we have about half girls on our team, even though they're about 10% across the league, and if I wasn't governor or in Congress, I'd probably be the coach. Uh, pretty soon your eight-year-old will be 15, 16, and I wonder, I wonder how you'll feel at that point. With that, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Banks. Uh, I now recognize Dr. Adams from Thank North Carolina for her five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, congratulations on your appointment. Um, you know, as a retired educator, 40 years, as a proud mom of a public school principal, I just want to echo the sentiments of my colleague, uh, uh, Ms. Wilson, and President Biden last night. Clearly, we've got to do better by our teachers. Uh, Governor Polis, thank you uh, for being here. Welcome back. Um, in, in 2019, uh, you announced a roadmap to build on college affordability efforts in Colorado. As an avid supporter of programs like the C Campus program and many of the emergency grant programs spurred by uh, federal COVID relief dollars, I was excited to see that one of the strategic goals within this roadmap is to increase uh, college completion. Uh, as we both know, many students struggle with barriers to to completion, such as lack of, of access to child care services or, or even struggling to access funding to cover tuition or last minute um, emergencies. So Governor, would you talk a little bit about promising efforts um, uh, institutions in Colorado have utilized to enhance uh, wraparound support services that help students thrive both academically and non-academically? So using American Rescue Act dollars, uh, we recently, last year, made it free to get a community college degree in healthcare-related fields. We all know the urgent needs in the healthcare workforce. That includes EMT, phlebotomist, nurse assistant, a number of others. When I went to Community College of Aurora to announce that program, uh, one young man shared his experience with me. He was training to become an EMT. And uh, since we made it free, and by the way, it's a real free, meaning not only no tuition, no textbooks, no fees, it's completely free, he said, with the money that I saved, because this program is free, I was able to fix my car to get to college. So that's what we mean when we say wraparound services. It's about how do you get there? If you have a three-year-old kid, how does your kid have childcare so that you can attend the program to better yourself and your earning livelihood? And we have to look at this expansively when we look at barriers. Yes, cost is one of them, but it could be something as simple as time of day, because you have to have a full-time job during the day. You need an evening program. You might need childcare. You might need transportation. You might need assistance with food. We have a hunger-free campuses initiative, because it's hard enough to learn on a full stomach. How hard is it to learn on an empty stomach? So those are some of the ideas that we've been able to use American Rescue Act funds to pursue. Great. Thank you very much. Madam Chair, I'm going to yield back the remainder of my time. Thank you very much. You get a gold star. Mr. Owens, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I, I want to uh, congratulate all of you. This has been well overdue, this conversation. Um, this is an area that we've uh, had problems for decades, and we're now seeing the results of that. Uh, I was aware back in 2017 to, to see a report coming out of the uh, Department of Education that 75% 
of the Black Board of the State of California could not pass standard reading and writing tests. Uh, now, unfortunately, uh, as terrible as that news is, it kind of went over the head of most people. They, they, they weren't surprised, they just kind of figured that's the way it is. Well, now we're seeing across the country uh, the power of the unions that led this demise of education and hopes in California was going across our country. So I, I think it's, it's timely that we're doing this. I think now as the country is waking up, we do what we do best. We're going to win, get our kids back, give them a chance to, to really believe in the American dream. And I want to thank everyone here uh, for your background, for your expertise, and uh, for educating us in the American people. We're going we're gonna to get this, uh, this taken care of. Uh, <clears throat> Ms. Pulsford, the cost of obtaining post-secondary credentials has nearly tripled the rate of inflation over the last two decades, forcing students to borrow for degrees without any guarantee that it will see a financial turn for the time and money invested in the program. In your testimony, you mentioned institutions like students and taxpayers need to have skin in the game when it comes to student loans, such as requiring them to reimburse students and taxpayers for the share of the financial loss associated with non-repayment. Non, non How would this, uh, such a requirement change incentives for colleges and universities when it comes to degree programs they offer and the price they charge students? How would this improve the value proposition to post-education, post-secondary uh, secondary, uh, um, education? Uh, thank you for that uh, question, Representative Owens. Uh, you know, fundamentally, I think if we believe that higher education is intended to be a path to opportunity and enable the economic and mobility of the students it serves, there are probably two parts to that equation. First and foremost, like, are, they, are institutions held accountable to providing and developing programs that actually map to the workforce opportunities. That also, by the way, includes liberal education, you know, whether it's in humanities or languages, et cetera. It's like you still have to d design those in a way that you're also intending to increase the readiness of the graduates in those programs for the, uh, for the work. Um, you, if, uh, the other part of that equation is what is the investment we're actually making, uh, asking students to make in that program? When you have institutions uh, or you're expecting institutions, requiring institutions to have greater skin in the game, they're gonna it's going to force greater accountability to designing and develop programs that are relevant to the future work and to also keep their costs in check. Right now, there's no check against the cost of delivering education, such that you've seen, as you pointed out, that the, uh, the cost of attending a completed degree has risen at more than twice the rate of inflation for many decades now, since 1980. Uh, and with, if the average cost of acquiring a bachelor's degree is nearing $100,000, there's of the outcomes, the value, like how many jobs are worth it to make that kind of investment. And so we, uh, we can certainly find ways by which we hold institution to greater accountability for both the cost of completing the credential and that those credentials are relevant to the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sullivan, I agree uh, with the workforce system must do a better job of getting Americans off the sidelines, equipping them with the skills needed to succeed in today's economy. For more than two decades, Utah has integrated their workforce development system with other safety net programs to provide unemployed workers a streamlined way to access, access the support they need to secure a job. Can you discuss how strong regional and statewide coordination between workforce development and human services providers can improve outcomes for the individuals they serve? What are the updates on OER that are needed to lead more states to pursue innovative approaches to workforce planning and service delivery? Sorry, thank you for the question. Uh, I think the integration between services that are provided, uh, oftentimes we provide the services to individuals uh, that aren't necessarily under WIOA. Uh, they may fall under a separate uh, portion of, of state government, a separate policy uh, act, but the coordination has to be there, not just simply the agencies working together, but also data. Uh, while we continue to pr uh, provide uh, the, the privacy uh, that is necessary, but also ensure that we're able to provide the benefits, the wraparound services that you heard the governor talk about a few minutes ago. But I think what, what we should focus on is to look back to see what students are doing as a result of some of the lack of coordination that is going on. Today, we may hear that, our, that enrollment is down in two-year colleges. The fact of the matter is, enrollment is down in credit-enrolled programs, the traditional programs. Students are showing up at our doorstep in long lines because they want to be a part of a short-term workforce opportunity that provides that value proposition that you just heard from President Pulsifer, the value proposition that gets them into the workforce in a shortened period of time. We cannot sustain individuals for four years while they go through degree programs. They simply need 
the education and skills to get into the workforce, and then education becomes a little different than what we've seen in the past. It becomes iterative, work and go to school and continue to grow that job path, perhaps through the baccalaureate degree or even graduate degrees, but you must start somewhere. I think the most important part is to ensure we get people into the economy. Thank you once again and appreciate this conversation. Well overdue, thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Jayapal, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam uh, Chair. Um, I wanted to spend my time just talking a little bit about federal student aid, which is designed to, to help underserved um, students and also the role of for-profit colleges. Um, I, I feel that sadly, for-profit colleges have been more interested in using these funds to pad their pockets. I have met personally with students, including from the Art Institute of Seattle, whose for-profit colleges abruptly closed before they could graduate. And all of their tragic stories end in the same way, high student debt, low quality education, and taxpayers ultimately footing the bill. And in contrast, owners of for-profit colleges emerge unscathed and proceed with business as usual. Of the nearly 1,100 colleges that closed between 2010 and 2020, an overwhelming 86% of them were for-profits. When one of these students tries to continue their education, they find that 83% of their credits are ineligible to transfer because of the school's poor accreditation and reputation. And I really think this undermines all of the good work that many of you are doing on this panel to provide a quality education. So let me ask you, and we can uh, start with you, Mr. Pulsifer, is it a good use of taxpayer funds to invest in these schools when you yourself are trying to make sure that people really have faith in, in the educational system? Uh, thank you for that question, Representative Jayapal. Um, the reality is, is that access without completion, to your point, and also completion without value, both of those are, are, are and can be a moral hazard. Uh, we've certainly seen that occur in many sectors of, the, uh, of, of higher education. Uh, I think that uh, emphasizes the point of that, as even Governor Polis said, is like we need innovation that expands access. We also need innovation that drives and aligns value of those credential pathways to the opportunity. We also need that accountability that's necessary, such that the we know that the federal dollars or even state level uh, dollars that they're actually going to institutions that can deliver real equity and access and equity and attainment, because equity and access without attainment, quite frankly, can be a scam. So and your answer would be, that. no, it's not a good use of taxpayer dollars to invest in those programs. Uh, the only thing I would caution is that uh, it is, is not necessarily exclusive to for-profit institutions. You actually have Understood. to look at all institutions yeah. and programs and ensure I, I agree with you. I'm just not. focusing on for-profit because it's been such a huge uh, you know, it's been such a huge abuse in my view. Governor Polis, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think, look, looking at accountability and ROI, one step more than accountability, across all modalities, online, in person, all types of formation, which could be public, nonprofit, for profit, uh, you are stewards of taxpayer money. You want to make sure that Congress wants to make sure that you are making good investments that benefit people. Uh, rather than to leave them in a worse place than they were. And that's across all modalities and forms of, of higher education. Well, the administration is taking this very seriously, and they've established a rule called the, uh, the Borrower Defense Rule, which streamlines student debt cancellation for students who are defrauded by these schools, uh, like those from the Art Institute in my district. Governor Polis, what are the consequences for students who are defrauded by their school or misled about their career prospects? First of all, I think that's an excellent step. Uh, these are students who, through no fault of their own, because in your own investigating to a college that looks accredited, you know, you can't know all the details of whether they're going to go out of business, and, 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 and you did accept federal money to do that, so yeah. there's some assumption there the federal government did some diligence. So I think canceling the debt on degrees that turned out not to be worth anything, like ITT or colleges that went out of business, uh, is a fair and very reasonable thing to do. A better thing to do would be the diligence on the front end to make sure that students don't have to waste the time and money uh, alongside uh, the federal investment. Many of them put their own money and of course they all put their own time to make sure that the programs that are supported are high quality across all modalities, across all types of entities that offer them. Yes, I completely agree with you, which is why I'm focusing on these for-profit colleges and the work up front. Um, the federal government has a responsibility to pre prevent abuses of taxpayer dollars, which is why I have a bill called Students Not Profits Act. Um, last Congress, the Build Back Better Act proposed stopping for-profits from receiving its Pell Grant investments. 
Uh, Governor Polis, how does limiting for-profit access to federal student aid prevent students from being abused? Well, I think you're, of course, you know, correct in identifying that uh, a higher percentage of the problems stem from for-profits. But I would also say that we would have the same problem with a poorly run uh, public institution or a poorly run nonprofit institution. Uh, there is, the data shows, a correlation, that's clear. But I think making sure that all uh, providers of education are accountable uh, across whether it's online or in person, or whether it's for-profit, non-profit, or public, uh, can help make sure that not only is Congress better stewards of taxpayer money, but also that students get better educational outcomes that improve the quality of their lives. Thank you, Governor, and thanks to the panel. Do I get a gold star too, Madam Chair? <laughs> Yield back. Uh, I now recognize Mr. Good for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, just to follow up on what was just, the question line that was just added, my friends on the other side just despise the term profit generally when it applies to a business, let alone education. And uh, I, I have an issue with these colleges with billion, multi-billion dollar endowments who are allowing college costs to soar exponentially for non-academic additions of staff and otherwise. Uh, I would call that for profit, by the way. But that said, I'm gonna direct a couple of questions to Mrs. Gentles. Uh, thank you for being with us today. In your testimony, you said, it's related to what we were just talking about, costs that over the last 20 years, K-12 administrative staff in public schools has increased by 88%, while student enrollment only increased by 8%. I doubt you would try to justify it, but can you begin to think of how that might be justified and what the impact has been from this, besides the exorbitant increase in costs, by increasing uh, administrative staff 88%. Right. I, I mentioned that in my written testimony, and I also mentioned that inflation-adjusted public school funding has risen by 152 percent. Teacher salaries have only increased by 8 percent since 1970. So we've been hearing a lot about teacher salaries. There seems to be an obvious fix, and that's to redirect K-12 funding to fund classroom activities and teachers rather than administrative bloat. And uh, it, it's laid out very, very clearly that the districts have grown in size and they have um, hired more and more adults and that does not serve the needs of students and it certainly doesn't benefit teachers. No question about it. I see that across my district, across my home state of Virginia and across the country where even where uh, student population is decreasing, uh, and we're not directing resources appropriately to the classroom where it makes an academic difference. Instead, we're, we're directing resources to non-academic positions, administrative bloat or worse. Uh, changing gears a little bit, but uh, appallingly and inexcusably, again, in Virginia, in Fairfax County, not far from here, uh, multiple schools are being investigated for unlawful discrimination because of a failure to notify students about their National Merit Scholar recognition even after some uh, college application deadlines has passed. And it's reported that a, a school official in Fairfax County actually told a parent that they wanted to inform the students in a low key way about their recognition, their achievement, in order not to hurt the feelings of those uh, who did not achieve the same level of uh, 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 academic achievement. In this district also, by the way, has spent $450,000 on equity consultants for administrators perhaps part of that 88% increase in costs for non-teaching staff. Can you imagine any justification for that? Why we would not appropriately want to recognize students who are performing excellently so they can earn scholarships accordingly for that achievement? Well, there seems to be a movement afoot to uh, take away the idea of merit, to no longer um, push children to um, to achieve or to even differentiate children by by skill levels or, or challenge them with different um, different levels of, of of courses that they can choose from. And so, this is all part of that that initiative. Another number to throw out for Fairfax County is that they had 170 million dollars left in their ESSER funding as of last fall that they. Had and spent. So we've been hearing wonderful examples of uses of ESSER funds that uh, districts in the, in the state of Colorado have, have invested in. And yet in Virginia, there was $2 billion overall that the districts had not yet spent last fall of, the, of this ESSER funding. Clearly, it was not used to reopen schools because Virginia was, I think, like the sixth worst in the nation. And my children um, were kept out of schools because of that in Arlington County and, um, and suffered as a result. It was isolating. It, it caused 
caused um, harm emotionally, academically, mentally, and we're seeing all kinds of problems in Arlington County, where I live, um, uh, with, with behavior, with drugs and, and other issues. So why weren't these ESSER funds spent? Why, why is there this focus on, on keeping children down rather than opening the schools and, and, and educating them? Well said. History will judge us harshly for how we sacrifice children on the altar of poor political decisions, harmful political decisions over the last two years. We were told that we needed $25 billion to safely open schools. We gave the schools $200 billion. I use the term we loosely, of course, voted against all of that. We gave the schools $200 billion when children were at no risk, by the way, of getting seriously ill from the virus. Uh, nice to look around this room and not see the masks that we know never worked, never prevented transmission of a virus. But what we did to the children, it's already been mentioned today, the lost learning that they will never recover from. And there's no plan to recover from that because we put teachers unions ahead of students uh, throughout this whole process. We continue to do it today. I had some questions for you about teachers unions, but thanks for your testimony. Thanks for being here today. And I yield back, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Ms. McBath, I recognize you. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Ms. Hayes? I, you're, you're on the list, Susan, later. I'm sorry. Yeah, Ms. Hayes, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman Fox and Ranking Member Scott um, for having this hearing, and thank you to all the witnesses that are here today. There's so many important things to consider in this committee. I can talk about the fact that any good teacher knows and encourages parental involvement because they know that that is key to student success. I can talk about the fact that teachers support all students regardless of orientation or identity. I could educate the people in this room about the fact that members of teachers unions are in fact teachers. I could talk a little bit about the fact that education funding is not, appro it's appropriated, but it's not spent on the first day of a school year because many academic programs have to play themselves out over the year. But today I will focus my questions on the labor shortage that was exacerbated by the COVID pandemic. But I have to remind everyone once again that we cannot consider any conversation surrounding the crisis in education without the backdrop of a global pandemic in which over a million people died. About the fact that the children who are in our schools, many of them lost family members and that has impacted them. So these were unprecedented times and we relied on the sciences and conducted ourselves accordingly as we got information. But back to the labor shortage. With teachers, healthcare workers, and childcare providers opting for early retirement, our country was faced to force the uncomfortable reality that we have long neglected to prioritize our workforce development. With the U.S. economy seeing record-breaking job creation under, under the leadership of President Biden, employers still have millions of job openings to fill. In Connecticut, childcare workers dropped 28% from 2019 to 2020. And according to the National Center for Education Statistics, more than half of the country's public schools reported being understaffed at the start of the 2022-2023 school year. 69% of public schools reported that the primary challenge staffing classrooms was they had too few teacher candidates applying for open positions. And in my state of Connecticut, we had over 1,000 openings week before, weeks before the school year began. In the 117th Congress, we passed the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act of 2022. That would have been a historic $78 billion investment in training 1 million workers annually in tw until 2028. The legislation included my bill, the Youth Bill for the Future Act, which invests $1 billion into youth bill programs over six years and improves support for vulnerable people. Mr. Moriarty, I thank you for your conversations about um, workforce development and what the, I'm sorry, Mr. Sullivan, and I believe this is a bipartisan issue that this committee should be able to find common ground on. Governor Polis, you mentioned that Colorado offers free community and technical colleges for, for students pursuing careers in healthcare and is hoping to expand this to early childhood education. 
Can you describe some of the difficulties with recruiting and retaining early childhood educators? And did you see youth employment as a significant contributor to the workforce shortage? Uh, thank you. We uh, are launching this fall uh, free universal preschool for every four-year-old in our state. Uh, it was a voter passed initiative that we put on the ballot and championed, and in, in our state it got 67.7% of the vote, which means it passed in red counties and blue counties, rural and urban. People of our state overwhelmingly said kids ought to be able to go to preschool. Now, uh, that's funded. Along with that, we need more early childhood educators. And again, it's quality. It's not uh, about a place to park your child. Of course, the immediate workforce benefit does help families. It's about preparing a child for the skills they need to succeed in school and beyond. And so we are looking to expand our Care Forward program funded from American Rescue Act, which currently funds free uh, community college degrees in the healthcare fields to include free community college degree for early childhood educators, also for paraprofessionals um, that play such a critical role of support in our schools. Thank you, I love that. As, I, as an educator, I know that college is not for everyone, so we have to make sure that we have equal opportunities for career and technical training and workforce development for today's economy. Um, do you believe that Colorado would benefit from in increased funding in programs like Youth Build or um, these workforce development type initiatives? Absolutely, to get to your second piece, um, in incorporating uh, workforce training for high school students, especially that aren't going on to college, uh, is an incredible pathway to success for them and very important for the economy. Uh, that can be done, for instance, by expanding flexibility under WIOA for in-school training programs. We have entire high schools like Colorado Early College High School where every student graduates with an associate's degree. We have other high schools where many students graduate with certificates and certain skills to be ready to enter the workforce after they graduate if they're not going on to higher education. Thank you. You made me lose my gold star. I yield back. <laughs> We'll, we'll try to figure out some way to recognize others. Uh, Ms. McLean, you're recognized for five minutes. My, the, the members of the committee can tell you about the report cards they got last time <laughs> and what a difference it made. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I will try and adhere to the gold star standard. Um, I just want to caution everyone uh, on the term the you, uh, of, of the word free. We seem to throw that word free out as if there is no one that pays the bill. I might remind you, someone is paying the bill, and free is a very slippery slope, because if it was free, that would indicate that no one pays the bill, somebody's paying the bill. So with that said, thank you all for being here today. Um, Mr. Pulsifer, and I hope I'm saying that right, um, I want to start with you. Is in your testimony you mentioned in December 2022 that the Government Accountability Office issued a report showing that roughly half of student aid offer letters calculated students out of pocket costs by factoring in loans. This means that students and families could be misled into believing that certain forms of student aid do not have to be paid back. Last Congress, I introduced the College Cost Transparency Act and Student Protection Act, which I will be reintroducing this Congress. I think transparency and honesty and knowing what you're getting into is critical for the student as well as, as the parent, as well as the colleges. So my question is this, do you believe colleges should be required to inform students of financing options that include personal resources, federal student loans, work study, and private plus loans. In addition to ensuring financial aid offers are transparent, that um, what other, uh, that's question number one, and then I would like to hear your thoughts on what other ways can Congress really simplify the college shopping process? Uh, thank you for that question, Representative McLean. Um, what we've certainly learned from our own responsible borrowing initiative is that the more you give complete understanding the, the, or the more you give complete transparency to the full cost of attending or completing your program, the individuals make better choices about how they actually fund that program. Agreed. Uh, that includes, by the way, the total cost of financing that through federal aid and federal loans. And so they need to understand that if, in fact, the total cost of what you're attending, that it's inclusive of not just tuition, books, and fees, but if that also includes room and board and other student life of fees or anything else like that. I think what we, you would find if you inspected the increased cost of attendance over time, that tuition, net tuitions remain relatively flat, 
but all these other costs have started going up substantially, and the students asked to pay for that. Do you see a downside in being transparent with all those costs? Uh, downside to the institutions, maybe, because, in fact, you're going to put at risk some of the revenue dollars that they're currently achieving, meaning that there's no but, downside, ultimately, for the student. Uh, like, if you keep the focus is, on the student. Right, which is why the institution is actually there to educate the student, correct? Uh, and, I th and I think it is absolutely okay. true. You heard that in my testimony, is that if everything that we could do, we would actually put the student at the center of higher education because Amen it's, for, that. Him that we, <laughs> for it's that for them that we're trying to deliver the value. And, and I don't mean to be rude, but in the interest of time, do you know any other ways or suggestions that um, Congress can simplify the college shopping? Yeah, there, uh, there's uh, certainly one presumption you can have, even if students don't take out federal aid, that virtually all of them apply for FAFSA, or they fill out the FAFSA, such that in that process itself, there are means and mechanisms by which you can introduce to students an understanding of what is actually the cost and the return on that investment you're going to make by choosing that program at that institution, and what alternative recommendations might there be that actually have higher value? Each of us experienced this in an in a online shopping world. Yes. Recommendations are yes. Thank so. you for that. I, I think it's interesting that you talked about return on investment because that off, 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 almost sounds like you're getting value for your dollar and you're kind of getting into that profit margin, which um, is scary. Um, my second is in your testimony, you noticed that colleges overcharge postgraduate students more than the actual cost of that degree because there's no cap on borrowing. Would you agree colleges should be more transparent and make it clear to potential um, postgrad students that they will be overcharged for these degrees? And what limits, if any, should Congress place on borrowing at the graduate level? Again, if we start with the assumption that the students are being asked to make an investment in their education so they can change their life for the better, the more information they have about the total cost of completing that and the return that they're going to get for that investment, they're going to make better choices. Today, institutions are not held accountable because of the unlimited amount that can be borrowed in Grad Plus loans. And we certainly have seen through the studies, including that which is advanced by the Wall Street Journal, that many of those programs do not actually fundamentally deliver any economic return and yet the costs are exorbitantly high. Hence the return on investment. That's right. With that, for the, I yield For the it. student. Thank you, sir. Thank yeah. you all. Thank you, Ms. McLean. Ms. Leisure Fernandez, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Chairwoman Fox and uh, Ranking Member Scott. Uh, uh, Governor Polis, we did not serve together, but we are neighbors. We, you are our vecinos up there in Colorado, and we share uh, many things uh, between Colorado and New Mexico. I will say our green chili is better than your green chili. I know you're going to agree on that. Um, but the issue of uh, the early childhood education, by a vote of 70 to 30, New Mexico has now targeted to put more resources into our earliest uh, you know, the babies, right? Because that's where we need to invest because we know that that has such an amazing return. And yes, it is an investment. The return, though, is about allowing a child to realize their full potential, and that is what education is supposed to be about. Education is what we use to make sure we have a democracy. Education is what we use to make sure that our economy thrives. And so I really do believe that we need to pay teachers what they deserve, because as we increased pay in New Mexico, we saw that a teacher gap drop. It makes sense, right? In a tight labor market, you need to pay teachers what they have earned and deserve. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about college affordability. Um, I am um, going to be reintroducing former Congressman uh, Levin's America's College Promise Act. Uh, under the bill, the federal government would partner with states at a 75-25% share to provide tuition-free community college uh, to all students for whatever they want to study, whether it be a nurse, whether they want to get uh, some of the degrees uh, and training that they need to be welders, to know how to be an electrician, the wide range of things, right? And we showed last year, we made uh, college free in New Mexico. What happened? 
Enrollment went up, right? That's what happens when you provide the means and opportunity. Can you share how you think Colorado's and New Mexico's effort to address college affordability could be enhanced with that federal-state partnership uh, that I've described in the uh, America's College Promise? There's no question that reducing the cost of higher education promotes equity, improves access, uh, we, uh, and affordability, which are many of the barriers. When we, through the Care Forward program with American Rescue Act funds, uh, made training in the, many of the healthcare-related fields, phlebotomy, nurse assistant, EMT, free, uh, it increased participation in these programs by about a third. And so we now have 1,000 people in our workforce today filling key roles in healthcare uh, because they were access the, able to access the education for free. To tie it into your first part of your comment, and I, we admire um, New Mexico's uh, investment in early childhood education. We're uh, following along in Colorado as well. Not having uh, childcare for your kid can also be a barrier to education. Mm -hmm. So when you look at how to make sure that a young mom can be able to go to school, to be able to get the skills she needs to earn a living, uh, if she has a two-year-old or a four-year-old at home, it's important that we have a real-life solution that meets their needs as well. So we need to look at all of these barriers that can occur, break them down, and at the same time, making sure that both the state and federal governments, as well as the individuals getting the education, the learner, are getting the return on investment for their time and money, meaning increased earning potential, meaning ability to find a job, meaning ability to support themselves and their family. Thank you, Governor Paulus. And we've had a lot of conversation today about apprenticeships. And uh, we have seen that uh, Democrats have been incredibly supportive of apprenticeships. I think that was one of the first bills that we uh, 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 reported to the floor of the House. I remember what was one of the first bills that I got to stand up and say, uh, you know, pass. I am in favor of this. It passed out of the House. Uh, according to the Department of Labor, 93% of apprentices complete their program and then earn on average 77,000 a year. Um, uh, we heard earlier the a ranking member talk about the dollar 44 cent return uh, that those who participate in these. Uh, you have a registered apprenticeship program in your state. Tell us how that works and how that could be a model as we move forward on apprenticeships. And I tell you, I'm really, uh, this is important for me because we are a state in transition. Yeah, we embrace all of the above, meaning registered apprenticeships, apprenticeships, uh, earn while you learn models, uh, including that uh, through career-wise model, working with high schoolers. Uh, there's many people that a barrier to getting the skills they need is they can't leave their day job and they have to work to support themselves. So how can we incorporate getting the educational skills they need to earn a better living into the time they spend at work? Thank you, Governor Polis, and I yield back. Thank you very much. Ms. Miller, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman Fox. Governor Polis, Emails revealed that teachers in Colorado schools were discussing a left-wing political ideology called gender identity with elementary school students. Governor Polis, do you think it's appropriate for an adult teacher to talk to an eight-year-old girl about changing her gender? I haven't seen those emails. Um, please share them with the school district. You're also welcome to scale them with us. Uh, these are not part of our state standards or curriculum uh, around health uh, or around social studies. Well, I appreciate that you were saying that you care about involving parents and protecting the children, but Governor, we are talking about five, six, and seven-year-old seven year children, and we would like to know, do you think it is appropriate for adults to be talking to them about sexual orientation and gender transitioning behind their parents' back? Because we do know this happened in Larimer County Laurel Elementary School. We have emails. What's important is that the teachers, the principals, meet the needs of all learners, all students. Mm -hmm. uh, no matter who they are, uh, no matter how they identify, uh, they need to learn math, reading, and writing. And uh, we, they need to involve the, the parents in making sure the kids are able to get the education they need, uh, no matter what their faith is, no matter what their gender is, or no matter any of the other great aspects of diversity that make our country a stronger place. So you think it is appropriate, you haven't answered the question yet, I wanna know, is it appropriate for adults to talk to an eight-year-old about sex and gender without parents' knowledge? Well, again, I don't yes know the no? incident you're referring to, but um, obviously I have a third grader and a fifth grader, and 
uh, their classmates know that, that they have two dads and um, you know it's never been a problem. And obviously if parents wanna have discussions with other kids about what they think or don't think about having two dads, they're welcome to, but. Well, this uh, isn't parents, sir. This is adult teachers having these discussions with very young children, five, six, seven-year-old children behind their parents' back, we wanna know is, do you think it's appropriate? Well, I, again, I don't know the incident you're referring to. I'm sure you'll be able to provide us with the information, but I can assure you that it's not part of our uh, state standards. Uh, it's certainly not part of our age-appropriate health standards, uh, nor is it part of our, our social studies standards to, uh, to have that as part of the curriculum at that age. Can you see why parents are upset that adult teachers are talking to their eight-year-old children about sexual orientation and transitioning? Well, again, I, I don't ha know the incident that you're referring to, uh, but uh, schools need to serve all learners, and that means kids with two dads, kids with two moms, kids who are raised by their grandparents, kids who identify in different ways. Uh, no matter how they identify or what background they come from, uh, the schools are there to teach them reading, writing, and math and, and make sure that they can get the basics so they can get a, succeed in life. Yes, but we wanna protect our children, and these are very young children that adults have been having discussions with behind parents' backs about sexual orientation and gender transitioning. And we just wanna know, is it appropriate or not appropriate? Again, I, um, if there's a particular incident that occurred in my state, you can share that with me and, and we'll be happy to share that with the school district because I'm not aware of the incident you're referring to. Uh, but again, it, uh, it's not part of the uh, standards to do that. And Thank again, you, schools, schools have to deal with every variety of diversity that, that society has and, and keep the focus on learning. Thank you, sir. Since day one, the Biden administration has been pushing puberty blockers and surgical castration on young children while cutting parents out. In conjunction with teachers unions, Biden is forcing woke political ideology in our school curriculum while ignoring the core subjects of reading, writing, and arithmetic. Just yesterday, sadly, reports showed that 23 schools in Baltimore have zero students proficient in math, zero. This is all fine to the Biden administration as long as our children learn about woke politics and something called gender identity. Parents are outraged and this indoctrination of our young children must stop. We want our children to be educated and smart. Thank you and I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Ms. McBath, you are recognized now. Thank you so much, Chairwoman. And I just have to say, I just really take offense to the continued use of wokeism, referring to the Democratic Party. Mr. Pulsifers, thank you so much for being here today. It's good to see you. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Fox and Ranking Member Scott. And thank you to our guests that are here today who joined us to discuss these very critically important issues and their impact on students and families across the country. As I have said to this committee before, this coming week is an incredibly difficult week for me and many, many others, as so many are from the communities, families, and classrooms that have been torn apart by the crisis of rampant gun violence in our country. Next week, I continue to mourn as we mark the fifth anniversary of the senseless number of 17, senseless murder of 17 students uh, and their teachers at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. Next week, I also continue to mourn and commemorate what should have been my own son's 28th birthday on February 16th. For me and those who remain behind, the pain of having to bury a child or losing a loved one never ever truly goes away. You carry it with you always deep in your soul, but you just learn to manage it. It's a pain that I would never wish on anyone here. But that possibility is a reality that students and their parents are facing every single day as they go to school in the morning or drop their kids off at the bus stop before heading off to work. From recurring lockdown drills to purchasing bulletproof backpacks for children still learning to read and write, students, teachers, and parents today are asked to endure the mental hardships and lasting trauma that they never had to face before school shootings began occurring at the terrifying frequency that our nation sees today. 
It is a preventable crisis that we cannot afford to ignore any longer, and it's critical that more steps be taken to address the epidemic of gun violence and school shootings that continue to plague our country. I applaud the important steps that we took to make schools safer through the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, but we can and we must do more. Every day that we refuse to enact the policies necessary to curb this epidemic, we allow more and more families to be torn apart and permanently scarred. We tell more and more students and parents and teachers that their leaders and elected officials are comfortable letting them bear the emotional, emotional burden of losing a loved one or being maimed and killed at a moment's notice. That is the reality that I and so many families live every single day, and it's one that we must not allow to become the new normal for students, teachers, and families today. My question is for Governor Paulus. Governor Paulus, can you briefly talk about why school climate and atmosphere such, I mean, is such an important factor in our children, children's educational outcomes and what the elements of an effective school climate program look like? So we appreciate the uh, bipartisan bill last year around improving gun safety, including funding for uh, schools to implement uh, common sense measures. We've added additional state resources around uh, hardening, uh, including uh, uh, single exit points and additional barriers. But you know that that's too late in the process to have a discussion, as you indicated. Um, there's a lot of forms of school violence. Uh, obviously, in the most extreme form, we've seen guns. We've also seen knives, fist fights, many of other things. Uh, what you need is to make sure you have a positive school culture that supports all learners where everybody feels valued. Um, a part of that is making sure kids have access to the mental health resources they need to get help when they need it. They know who to talk to through the I Matters program funded through ARPA funds. Kids in Colorado can get six free counseling sessions privately uh, when they need to. Uh, the information is posted up in the schools about how to do that. Many school districts have invested in additional counseling to better support kids that have behavioral health needs to make sure before they lash out or take it out on others or themselves, uh, they're able to get the help that they need. You and also in response to your answer, what can we as members of this body do to prevent this culture, this really violent culture from furthering uh, um, and, and, and just really re wreaking havoc on our schools? I think really focusing on positive school culture and school environment, having site leaders, parents, educators involved, making sure that kids feel supported in schools, that their needs are met, they know who to go to if they see something, uh, and that the right intervention can occur promptly. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you very much. I now recognize Mr. Moran for five minutes. Ms. Gentles, thank you for being here today. I'm gonna to direct my questions to you uh, for just a few moments. Uh, you mentioned earlier the Parents' Bill of Rights that uh, likely is going to come through this committee this year. I want to read a statement to you and see if you would agree with this statement. The parental right to guide one's child intellectually and religiously is a most substantial part of the liberty and freedom of the parent. Would you agree with that? I'd agree with that. This statement, as you likely know, was made in a 1925 U.S. Supreme Court case by the name of Pierce versus Society of Sisters. It was a unanimous decision by the Supreme Court in 1925 to strike down the 1922 Oregon law that attempted to compel elementary school children to attend public schools to the exclusion of other choices. In doing so, uh, the court, when it struck down this law, said that it, quote, unreasonably interferes with the liberty of parents and guardians to direct the upbringing and education of children under their control. Would you agree also with that determination and finding? I would agree with that, and I believe that they also said that children were not mere creatures of the state, and I certainly agree with that. That's right, and, and like you, I agree with these statements, and I agree with that, that precedent unanimously uh, held by the Supreme Court almost 100 years ago as a father of four school-aged children. You mentioned you have two children. Uh, I have double that amount, but I've been in both gifted and talented um, meetings and also art meetings. I proudly serve uh, my community by, uh, by helping with an education foundation and helping to start one for our public school system. And I proudly send my kids to a public school system, the same one that I graduated from. But I recognize that parents need choices and every child is different. And every decision for every child must be made by those parents in their education. 
I, w I wonder if you could comment about what you believe the role of this committee should be and what we could do to preserve the parents' rights to guide the education of their children in this nation. Well, I think redirecting the K-12 education system to prioritize academic instruction is a, is a big role. Um, that's what parents want. They want schools to focus on academic instruction. They want math and reading to be at the center of what the child is presented at the, the school. They want academics, not activism. And so th there are numerous steps that you can take to do that. I think holding school districts accountable for what they did during, during the COVID era with closures um, that harmed children and um, how they spent the emergency funding, is it going to address learning loss? That's gonna, that's gonna meet the needs of, of parents. And then reinforcing uh, federal, existing federal laws, PPRA, FERPA, making sure that parents know what their rights are under existing federal law will, will be an important message that you can send from this, from this committee. And likewise, I would pose a, a similar question with respect to your advice to local school districts. As they seek to partner with parents to be at the center of educational decisions for their local school districts, what advice would you give to be good partners with the parents at, at local level? Well, the federal government did give them advice and, to, and said that parents needed to be consulted as part of the federal, uh, federal funding, and districts weren't even able to, to comply with that in, in many areas. So. There just needs to be a, a reckoning with um, what's become of the relationship between school districts and, and parents. Um, the parents going to the school board meetings and speaking up, that was very courageous in a, in a time where things had become quite adversarial. It has not resulted in a change in that relationship. That school districts need to recognize that parental involvement is key to student success. If that district wants to achieve what it's set out to do, which is educate children, it has to involve parents in a non-confrontational and inclusive way. Switching gears uh, one moment for a final question. Uh, you are not a medical doctor, but in your testimony, you highlighted that the education establishment's embrace of so-called gender-affirming gender care is at odds with steps being taken in other countries to reduce or eliminate such interventions. Why are these practices so harmful and why is American medicine so out of step with other countries' approaches in this regard? Well, fortunately, the state of Florida and specifically their Board of Medicine has taken a look at the evidence. They've done a systematic review of evidence and concluded that what is called gender affirming care is actually um, not helpful and, and in fact harmful um, to the often emotionally vulnerable youth who are drawn into this system. Um, European nations are ahead of us in this process. Uh, Sweden's done a systematic review. The, the uh, United Kingdom has as well. And the UK shut down their pediatric gender clinic as a result of the review, recognizing that it's harmful. Thank you for your answers today, and thank you for your efforts on behalf of our children. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Moran. Mr. Bowman, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Uh, Mrs. Gentles, uh, you mentioned the state of Florida uh, in some of your remarks uh, just then. Do you support the state of Florida's decision to remove AP African American history from its curriculum? That's not something that I have, have looked into, and I don't think from a federal perspective that, it, that um, Congress needs to get involved in what a state should or shouldn't teach. I'm not sure if, if that is the, the role of the, that isn't the role of the, of the federal government. But well, I'm that's asking a, a you state. your opinion. Do you support the teaching of African American history? Absolutely, I support the teaching of African American history. Fourth grade uh, social studies in Virginia has a real emphasis for that. You also, I'm sorry, reclaiming my, my time. Do you also support the teaching of Latino history? For sure, yeah. This so is you support the, t the teaching of all history, multicultural history in every American school. Um, you support that. Right. We need to have a robust and full um, history uh, um, standards and, and lessons and, and curriculum so that, that all, all topics are, are addressed. So do you support the teaching of queer and gender studies in public schools? I'm not sure what you mean when you say queer and gender studies. That doesn't sound like something that would be an elementary level, for example, appropriate topic. What about middle school and high school? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what you're, you're saying when you're saying queer and gender studies. So I'm a former educator. I worked in education for 20 years. I was a middle school principal for 10 and a half years, and I had students who identified as 
gay or lesbian or queer. And it was very important for them to feel safe and comfortable and seen and heard and recognized in our school curriculum. And that helped them to have higher levels of self-esteem, self-worth, and it helped them to thrive academically in my school. So I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that. Do you support the teaching and supporting of queer and uh, gender studies in schools? I, I honestly am not familiar with a, a, a curriculum or, or a, a, a class that would be an appropriate class, queer. What about authors? Studies. What about authors and books? Uh, there are many books who are authored by uh, authors who identify as queer. Uh, many of this, these books in Florida have been you know, taken off of bookshelves along with many other books. Do you support the removal of classroom libraries in Florida or in public schools across the country? Well, I'm pretty contrary by nature. So when books like To Kill a Mockingbird and, and other books uh, were, were being brought up as, as controversial, then I went out and ordered them to make sure that my daughters weren't kept from reading them in, in their um, public schools. Um, but when you're talking about schools that specifically direct children to um, sex acts, sex apps, or, or lay out specific How many schools? Uh, sexual reclaim, instruction, reclaiming my time, I'm sorry. How many schools have been identified as teaching this so-called, or providing this so-called woke indoctrination agenda? How many schools? So there are examples. Have you identified everywhere. a number of schools that are so-called implementing a woke indoctrination agenda? Is there a number? No, that might be something that the, the, the committee So there's no could, number. So in your testimony, on, there's you, anecdotal evidence In your testimony, you continue to make generalized statements about schools this, parents that, teachers this, but you cannot tell me a number right now of schools that are implementing this sort of curriculum. Uh, let me just reclaim my time. Also in, your, also in your testimony, you drew a contrast between balanced literacy and phonics. Can you talk to me about that contrast? Yes, thank you for that, that question. Balanced literacy refers to what's often called as cueing, which is a, a debunked approach to um, teaching reading that taught what students to guess. It, it, it teaches children to memorize words, to um, guess the sentence based on the context. They look at pictures and they, and they guess and to skip wo over words that they're not familiar with. The contrast of that is, is uh, phonics instruction, what helps children spell out and, and break down the, the building blocks. Okay, language. let me just reclaim my time. As I mentioned, I taught in, uh, in public schools for 20 years. I was an elementary school teacher. Phonics is a major component of balanced literacy. Balanced literacy includes the teaching of reading, writing, listening, and speaking, and it also includes the teaching of phonics instruction. That's why it's called balance. It is not separate from phonics instruction. Phonics instruction is supposed to be part of balanced literacy. It's important for you to know that. It's important for everyone on this panel to know that. Uh, I just have a few more questions while I don't have much time left, but I would like to go to Governor Pol uh, Pol Polis. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how to build a positive school culture? In 10 seconds, wow. Well, it really includes a partnership with parents first and foremost. We've heard this from both sides of the aisle. It needs to be implemented, in fact. A great site leadership is so important. And then bringing educators along with that vision for the school, including aligning uh, curriculum to standards. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, and uh, Governor, you get a gold star. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Williams, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, Governor, as the executive of a significant state, I really admire you for uh, your investment here and your patience and dealing all these things. My wife is a native of Colorado uh, from uh, Fort Carson, uh, there only briefly before her father was deployed to Vietnam. Um, and just a last little biographical, uh, biographical um, comment is that my wife and I both homeschooled our children, uh, though we're the product of excellent uh, public education and have had significant uh, uh, further education, uh, that was the best choice for us. Um, sir, I commend you. you. You have been a consistent champion for school choice, and I very much applaud everything that you've done for the children of Colorado to ensure that a child's zip code is not the determinant factor of their quality of education. I'm personally saddened that school choice has become more partisan in recent years, although it looks like it's making a comeback. Uh, I'm excited about that. Um, 
but it really shouldn't be a partisan issue. Uh, school choice is about giving every child a chance to succeed in life, no matter their circumstances. I did read your testimony, um, in case you think all is lost or we don't pay attention, but uh, you said we can't rely on the old ways of doing things. I just invite um, your comments, sir. Can you explain briefly for this committee why you support school choice, and can you offer advice how we as Republicans and Democrats can come together on this issue? You've done this successfully, and I would like to learn. I'll give you an example of a way in Colorado, Democrats came and Republicans came together on school choice. So we're home to over 400,000 military families like the family your, your wife was born into. Uh, many people get stationed in Colorado, including people with young kids, at a different time of year than the traditional open enrollment season. And so many of them were effectively excluded from the open enrollment process uh, had to enroll in their neighborhood school, and many want to enroll in their neighborhood school. That's a fine choice. Uh, however, what we did uh, through the state legislature, and I was able to sign a bill to do it, is we created a special uh, open enrollment period, a different timeline for military families that are assigned to Colorado so that they can uh, have their school of choice for their child, space, permission, space uh, permitting, of course. Um, we have open enrollment within school districts and across school districts in Colorado. Um, we also try to learn from schools that have a lot of demand and therefore need to have lotteries and we're saying what are they doing well, how do we expand or replicate that. Some of them are district schools, some of them are charter schools. It's not about the model of the school, it's about the quality and it's about the educational outcomes. Finally, I'd point out that what's good for one kid isn't necessarily good for another. Um, I have two kids, many on this committee have different kids, and you know that many kids have different learning styles. Some might want a hands-on outdoor experiential ed model. Uh, some might want a more rigorous college prep model. Some might benefit from additional uh, vocational or hands-on ways of learning. And uh, while every possible model uh, isn't necessarily available to every kid, we want to make sure that more kids across our state can access the education that works for them. If I may, just to follow up, um, the model that's been um, talked about from a, um, a governance standpoint, a governing standpoint, and because you're, you know, obviously have a very large uh, responsibility in education in your state, you know, I've seen that the resources should follow the child instead of the institution and funding a child's education uh, as a focus rather than, um, you know, a system. Uh, a lot of the things you mentioned really talk about enrollment, you know, in the public uh, schools uh, with some flexibility for charter. You know, I think back to our own experience uh, of extending that to parochial schools, to uh, homeschooling, which was the right uh, choice for our family. Uh, do you have any uh, thoughts or suggestions along those lines? Uh, we do have many uh, school districts uh, and charter schools that uh, partner with and support homeschooling families. I think what's missing from some of these models, like uh, the Arizona model that's been touted on, the, on this panel, is the quality and accountability. How do we know it's working if we don't know their student achievement? How do we make sure that if there's taxpayer resources being used, uh, that there is quality? Um, and, and so there needs to be some way of doing that, some structure for doing that, some accountability for doing that, some transparency into that, because these are public funds. Uh, certainly we want to make sure that we can innovate with home schools, with other kinds of schools, uh, to make sure that as long as they're willing to have the transparency that accompanies public funds, there's a way to incorporate the innovation they bring. Respectfully, just for the last 10 seconds, um, we homeschooled in uh, four different jurisdictions, Washington State, uh, briefly in Florida, New York State, and New York City, which of course is its own. And uh, our son is uh, a senior at Georgia Tech in Aerospace Engineering. So uh, homeschooling did work in our case. Thank you for your comments, sir. Thank you very much. Mr. Mervan, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman Fox. Um, I'd like to thank the panel for being here today. And uh, Governor Polis, uh, I'm from Indiana, Northwest Indiana. and. Um, my daughter is a sophomore and she went through the Explore Engage Experience Grant and came home and said she wants to be a lawyer so she could afford what she likes. Uh, but I bring that up because uh, that experience that you mentioned is something that makes them think about what they wanna do when they grow up. And um, I appreciate you mentioning that from being from the state of Indiana. Uh, very quickly, uh, realizing the key successful economic development is an educated workforce. Uh, very often in the most vulnerable populations becomes challenges and hurdles, such as child care, such as transportation, uh, such as dependent care and housing. 
Uh, there are significant barriers or challenges to employment. However, these services provided by Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, the WIOA as we know it, allow the workers to receive job training and create paths of their choosing towards economic stability. My question to you is what impacts do these services have on training programs, completion, and employee retention? Yeah, these, uh, the program, the flexibility within WIOA to be able to support these wraparound services is critical. So to be clear, it's not transportation for the sake of transportation. It's not childcare for the sake of childcare. It's directly related to the ability to become part of the workforce. Um, somebody, we, we've traditionally focused the money on the skills piece, and obviously that's a relevant piece. They need to have the skills. But if you have the skills, but your reality is you're the caregiver for a child during the day hours uh, where you want to be working, or you don't have a car and there's not a bus route to get to work, how can we be flexible enough with WIOA where we can make sure that that person is able to work and support themselves and address the barriers that they have in their own life. And I was a former township trustee to get to the point we uh, managed uh, the most vulnerable populations. And in order to give them a lift up, we were able to provide transportation through a bus service. We were able to provide child care. So I commend you. Um, one of my questions that I think is a key component is, how in education did you uh, utilize the American Rescue Plan dollars to most maximize what was going on in education? Lots of different ways. So um, the, the ESSER and the GEAR funds are, are two of those. Um, I would say across the state, making sure that we could reduce and address the learning loss. Uh, a lot of this was decentralized and districts and schools were able to innovate as they should. Many of them included extended learning day, uh, additional hours of support. We're looking at directing additional state dollars to uh, after school math support as an example for kids that are struggling in math. Free summer clinics, many school districts in the past either had to charge for or had very limited ability to offer free slots. Uh, for academic tutoring in summer. Uh, many districts leaned into that last summer and are planning the same for this summer to help make sure that students are caught up for success. And supporting innovative programs through gear that broke down barriers between community colleges, school districts, and workforce. Uh, example, in the San Luis Valley, a number of school districts worked with Adams State uh, College in the area uh, to provide transferable and aligned dual and concurrent enrollment credit in many of the rural districts that surround the college. Thank you. Um, Mr. S Dr. Sullivan, uh, you had talked about uh, workforce development and engagement in community college and short-term college um, programs that allow in entrance into the workforce. Can you just share with me some success stories of industry and those colleges and those programs working together in order to have the outcomes of people getting into the workforce quickly? Sure, great, great example. Uh, first of all, commend uh, the state of, of Indiana uh, for the Ivy Tech. Great work that is going on there, one of the nation's best uh, community and technical college system. So uh, I know you have a great deal to be proud of. There. I will share that with them. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, just as a, as, as a broad uh, statement, I know many of you are aware of the broadband initiatives that are going on around this country, trying to establish uh, broadband for the people of this country. Someone has to lay that broadband. Someone has to lay the fiber. Uh, we are in the midst of what has been now about a 10-week process of developing curriculum, of working with folks within the industry uh, to identify the skills needed and to help those individuals become certified. Companies uh, like right there, uh, Louisiana Delta Community College in the northeast part of the state, uh, who's working with Etheridge uh, Pipeline and, and Conduit. These folks are coming onto the campus, bringing equipment, bringing expertise to teach individuals. So we are, we are forecasting about 2,000 uh, graduates by the end of this current year within the broadband space uh, to help ensure that we have the people necessary that we're not asking folks from Indiana to come to Louisiana sure. to install fiber, but instead that we're able to do that work ourselves. Thank you, Dr. Sullivan. I was proud to, vo to vote for the uh, infra infrastructure bill that allowed for that fiber to be laid, which created jobs which will open the gates for education. I thank you very much for all your participation today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mervan. Ms. Houchin, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, I'm really, uh, Glad to talk about this subject matter today. Um, I'm glad that our first full committee hearing is focused on such an important issue or such important issues. Like Dr. Fox said in her opening remarks, you know, this could not be more rewarding work than looking out for the interest of students. Um, Ms. Gentles, my first question is for you. I, I really appreciated um, your written testimony. I took particular interest in your discussion of literacy. 
Um, my son is dyslexic. Many of our colleagues have children with um, dyslexia or other reading disabilities. So I've worked on this issue very closely in the state of Indiana as a legislator. Uh, you note the problematic use of balanced literacy. Um, I appreciate your mention of, of the, um, the book by Emily Hanford, um, sold a story how teaching kids to read went so wrong. And I have experienced that firsthand, uh, both as a mom and a legislator. Um, we are making progress toward a more phonics-based instruction. I'm really glad of that. Um, but I do know firsthand how hard it is to turn the bureaucratic barge. Um, you know, in the state of Indiana, we fought the Department of Education to implement a screening for students with dyslexia and implementing uh, reading specialists in the schools who have an understanding of the issue and how to teach kids to read. Um, you know, we have seen maybe a failure of what I would call the education industrial complex in this space. Uh, reading scores are not just keeping pace, they are declining and they have since we changed our methodology. So what more can we be doing at the federal level to encourage this transition to phonics-based instruction and bridge the gap, particularly in the higher education space? Right, when you, you mentioned reading scores going, going down, eighth grade math scores got a lot of attention with Nate, but it should be noted that a uh, third of fourth graders are below basic in, in reading and 30% um, of eighth graders are below basic. Below basic is appalling. Um, and so keeping attention to uh, where those, sc those scores are dropping, but then shining a light on, on where, they, where they went up. Where are the success, success stories? And Colorado is, is one of them when it comes to, to reading and ensuring that, uh, that this, this transition over to an, a more appropriate ap approach is, is happening. Mississippi is a great success story. So I think here at the committee, you can shine the light, um, bring the, the the leaders and the um, and the people who have implemented reading instruction and approaches to um, setting curriculum standards at the state level and implementing them at the district district level here so that people can can know those models and follow them that's great um, and I, I would like to know when we're talking about learning losses as a parent of a child with an IEP uh, COVID learning losses uh, we, all students were impacted, but no more than students with disabilities on IEPs. Um, you know, we didn't have um, specialized training to teach our children. Um, I am not trained in the methodologies that help students with dyslexia. Um, so that is something that we'll continue to have to strive to overcome. Um, I do, Madam Chair, I, I would like to um, highlight um, that the students that, with, that have dyslexia and the, Institute of, uh, the Dyslexia Institute of Indiana uh, reached out to me with regarding um, strong support for a phonics-based approach. And I'd like to submit a brief statement um, to the record uh, by the Dyslexia Institute of Indiana that they provided to my office. Without objection. Thank you. Um, a couple of things I want to uh, uh, switch to Mr. Sullivan. Um, I did have the opportunity to visit with Ivy Tech yesterday. Um, certainly, we're very proud. And um, one of the things we talk about is the record number of job openings and the lower workforce participation rate and what we can do to increase that. Um, Ivy Tech is working on uh, increasing and drilling down on what high-skilled certifications are necessary. Um, so that high-value industry-based cer certification um, what is the single greatest barrier, in your opinion, to, to those types of credentials? Well, thank you for the question. First of all, I would, I would say to you, they are high cost programs, which is one of the key areas. Uh, they're also programs that are difficult to identify faculty uh, for because they are typically the more skilled uh, individuals. And so there, there are a number of, of challenges, but I wanna, I wanna be really clear of, of what you just said. Information is powerful. If you have the ability to point out a sector it is a growth sector in, in Louisiana, as an example. The cybersecurity uh, space is, is a growth area, as I'm sure it is in many states around the union. Uh, so as we begin to develop those programs, as we deliver those programs to ensure we have the workforce there, I, I'll simply point out that our students are voting with their feet. Yeah. Time is the enemy. One other point that I can't help but point out here. This nation has millions of adults who do not have a high school diploma. As we sit today and talk about K-12 education, how in the world can parents be informed about their K-12 education of their child when they don't have an education themselves? 
And in the WIOA Act, adult basic education has been second fiddle for far too long. We are not serving the needs of adult students through WIOA, through adult basic education at the level that we need to. It's about skills. Yes, the high school diploma and equivalency is important, mm -hmm. but we must find a way to put skills in front of these individuals so that they have the ability to get into the economy and to produce for their families. I couldn't agree more. Thank you so much. You. I yield back. Thank you. Ms. Stevens. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, it's, it's evident we have three great community college systems represented here today, LCTCC. We're very proud of your background, Dr. Sullivan. Ivy Tech, which I've gotten to know from my time in workforce development, and Oakland Community College in Michigan. It is Community College Week in Washington, D.C., and folks are talking about the skills gap. Now, in the 116th Congress, we introduced the College Affordability Act as a Democratic majority, which included the expanded Pell Grants. I was just outside talking with our, our community college friends from Michigan about this, and so Dr. Sullivan, I was wondering if you could extrapolate on this opportunity of expanding Pell for some of the short-term work programs to get people into skills and employment opportunities. First of all, thank you for the question. Uh, this is an area where it is clear that we have bipartisan support. When you think about the number of individuals stranded in this economy, 60 million individuals who don't have the skills needed in order to be able to get that first job, we have a point in time opportunity to change the trajectory of millions of Americans and ensure that they get back into the economy. When you think about being down five percentage points in workforce participation, think of the millions of people that are impacted. Think of the millions of young people that are impacted. And I would say to you this, the best teaching for young people is to watch their parents. Let's give those parents an opportunity to be educated and skilled at a level that allows them to provide for their children and their family. That is the greatest education a young person can see. Well, this is a great action item for us in the 118th Congress and a way to come together. And as we talk about the uh, American education in, in crisis, we, we know that our waivers for free and reduced lunch that were expanded during the pandemic have expired. And we have 10 million students at risk of going hungry. My father was a public school teacher and often brought culinary into his classroom to, to meet those needs. We know that 96% of school systems in this country are now saying that they are experiencing debt. And obviously, Mrs. Gentles, I know in your testimony, you had a, a brief section uh, talking about the worsening school climate. And I was just wondering if you could validate that not having the monies for schools to provide free and reduced lunch is contributing to that worsening school climate. I'm not, I'm not sure what you're talking about. I apologize uh, as far as not having You're not sure money. what I'm talking about with regard to the free and providing free and reduced lunch and the fact that we don't have waivers and schools are uh, 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 incurring debt as a result? Yeah, it's I'm been not, in the news a lot. The, 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 the fact that schools are going into debt because they don't have Correct. The, their free and reduced life, price lunch funding. No, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with that. Well, we'd issue. be happy to exchange with you on that. And certainly, I know in your brief section in your testimony dedicated to the worsening school climate, one would oblige that not having the monies to provide lunches, which Mr. Polis, our, our great governor of Colorado, you, you've implemented some tremendous programs for the, the pandemic relief and for providing free and reduced lunch. And I was wondering if you could share with us specifically some of the results that you're seeing in, in, in Colorado. Yeah, so of course we, uh, like most states, took advantage of the extended free lunch during the pandemic, and we now have chosen, uh, starting next fall, to move forward with uh, free lunch for uh, everybody available and free breakfast as well. Uh, what that means is, of course, it's optional. Some parents want to pack lunch, that's fine. Removes any stigma associated with school lunch, and frankly, reduces a lot of paperwork and overhead associated with who pays what and who does what. It makes it a lot easier freeing up school resources to be used on teacher play and pay and classroom instruction. So first and foremost, making schools have the nutrition, kids have the nutrition they need uh, to succeed if they, get, they don't get those healthy meals at home. Reducing overhead uh, and bureaucratic waste. Uh, and, uh, and saving uh, families money on lunches. And you have a ballot measure cooking uh, to alleviate the burden of filling out school meal applications and ensure that no child falls through the cracks. This is something we hear a lot, the stigma, the shame. C could you speak to that ballot measure? 
uh, with with the uh, free lunches, did you yeah. say? Yeah. So uh, we, we there's no longer any forms associated with it, uh, which had always been an issue, especially for non English speaking families, for families that valued their privacy. Um, you know, all these sort of uh, nosy, you know, government questions just to get the lunch. You no longer have to answer those. It would be, you know, lunch or provided to, to everybody. Uh, if you want to take advantage of it, you can. There's no check card you need. Uh, there's no stigma associated with it. And it will save uh, every family who wants to participate in that uh, the, the cost of a school lunch. Feed our kids, educate America. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. Thank you very much. Mr. Grossman, you're recognized for five minutes. There we are, Mr. Pulsifer. Uh, Western Governors delivers an education through competency-based education model. I'd like you to elaborate that a little bit and see what we can do to amend the Higher Ed Act to accommodate that or your opinion of the benefits of it. Uh, sure. You know, uh, over a century ago, we kind of established and codified a credit hour into our system of higher education, uh, and something that started really as a way for faculty to accrue hours and get paid became somehow a measure of learning. Uh, well, competency-based takes a very different approach, which is it tries to keep the standard for learning, meaning the, the proficiency against a particular uh, learning outcome, like that is actually what determines that you've actually uh, developed the competency that's necessary to complete the course. When you design around that model, it allows a couple things I'll just highlight. First and foremost, it allows you to more directly align the learning outcomes with the work uh, and that which they need to be readied for. Second, it actually allows you to personalize learning such that an individual can leverage that which they may already be quite skilled in and can move quickly through that, and they can dedicate more time and attention to the things that they need to focus on and, and may have less uh, preparedness in. But at the end of the day, what you can determine with a competency-based approach is that every individual has been assessed and validated proficient against those learning outcomes. A uh, last thing I'd say on this, uh, Representative Grothman, is that competency-based education is not new. Uh, if you talk about any licensure area in medicine, in law, in the practice of nursing, even in accountancies, like all of these individuals have to meet proficiency standards. Well, the same can apply in higher education as a practice. It would seem to make common sense that you would uh, uh, focus more on people, what people know, than how long they've been sitting at a desk. Doesn't it seem that way? Yeah, it certainly seems. I often like to say that virtually every one of us who may have gone to a conventional model already experienced personally competency-based education. You can think of that course where you realize that I didn't need to sit through all the lectures, but I had to wait till the end of the term to take the final. What competency-based education allows is the individual, when they actually are ready and can take their assessments and, and pass those assessments, they're done with that course and they can progress. And we've seen that, uh, one, increase the personalization, two, it also reduces the time that students need to actually acquire their degree. Saves some costs, too, right? A, a lot of costs. When a bachelor's candidate can finish their degree program in two and a half years versus four, you're significantly reducing the cost to attain the credential they need. Bingo. Well, we'll, we'll switch over here to Virginia De Generals. Um, uh, there, there's some numbers before me here that even I'm shocked at, and I don't think I could be shocked. It says here among English teachers, there are 97 Democrats for three, every three Republicans, and among health teachers, 99 Democrats for every Republican. I think it's accurate to say in this country, we're divided about 50-50, right, every presidential election, maybe 51-49 or something. Um, overall, 87 Democrats for every 13 Republicans. I'm not a big one on all this diversity stuff, but I do think, say when you're picking out novels for kids to read, and novels a lot of times have a message in them. Uh, you, you would expect about 50-50 uh, as far as English teachers, history teachers, what have you. Um, but it's not that way at all. I, I think that's one of the major reasons why there's such a lack of support for education today among some people. Could you comment on that a little bit uh, as how this happened and what we can do to turn it around? And can we ever be considered to getting a holistic education if we have so many teachers on one side of the ideological spectrum? Could you even have a good school? Well, I'm a product of public education, K through 12, growing up in, in Florida, and I'm happy to say I have absolutely no idea what the partisan affiliation of any single teacher that I had growing up. So I, I, I think one solution would be to create uh, an emphasis in, in the classroom that uh, the, 
to on academics and rather than on activism and ensure that teachers are reminded that it's it's not appropriate to bring in their their partisan uh, approach to to the classroom a, another another approach would be to um, make the right. teaching profession I, I, welcoming yeah. to people of, of all different political yeah. persuasions I, I don't want to cut you off to me the problem is even if you say you're being non-ideological every novel has a message in it, right? And if you're a hardcore Democrat, you you want to give the kids a different, different message than more of a traditional person. What can we do to get back to 50-50? And again, I'll, I mean, when I went to college, by the way, I remember, you can tell you how old I am, I'll, I would say half the teachers of the school had Jordan McGovern buttons on, so I knew what was going on there. But uh, yeah, can you think of any way we can get back to, say, in English literature's about a 50-50 split here. Again, I think that the teaching profession needs to be welcoming to people of all different perspectives. And when you have an environment right now that encourages teachers to uh, keep secrets from, from parents, there are people of maybe a more conservative persuasion that aren't comfortable with that, and they're not going to want to stay in the teaching profession or join the, the profession. So perhaps if the profession is, is more inclusive of a, a wide range of values and, and includes more conservative values, there, there might be more of a balance. Is there any way the, gen the gentleman's time's expired. Uh, Ms. Manning, you're recognized. Thank you, mm -hmm. Madam Chair. <clears throat> I want to associate myself with the earlier remarks of my colleague, Mr. Takano. It is concerning that extremists are being given a platform in the Congress of the United States to spread misinformation and disinformation by citing anecdotal incidents or by citing their own articles as evidence to back up their misinformation about what is going on in general in our schools. This is a serious body that has important work to do for the American people and America's children. We have real issues to deal with, and that is what my constituents sent me here to address. I do appreciate the focus and discussion today about the critically important issue of apprenticeship programs and technical training programs and community colleges. These types of educational opportunities are particularly critical to my district, where we are now seeing the growth of good paying jobs in advanced manufacturing that require education beyond high school. Uh, Governor Polis, the public workforce development systems can only be successful if employers see value in engaging with these systems. Given your experience working with employers in your state, do you think the workforce systems are providing value to employers, and are there key areas that need to be strengthened? I applaud the work of uh, CareerWise uh, now helping to link uh, the employer side in Colorado and several other states. We as a state see value in this, uh, and I believe in putting our money where our mouth is, meaning we ourselves as a state, we have now partnered uh, with apprenticeships in several of our state agencies to be able to make sure that we can benefit from the work of individuals who are getting education while they do it. We see the benefit. So many private sector employers across our state increasing numbers uh, and happy to uh, submit the list of participating employers to the committee uh, are seeing the benefit. Because when I talk to CEOs, chief HR officers, and many of the major employers in our state, the number one issue they bring up is always how do we attract and retain the talent we need to succeed? And they see uh, apprenticeships and these kinds of uh, models uh, as a key strategy towards achieving their own goals of making sure they can attract and retain the people they need to continue their success. Thank you. And are there ways that you think employers could do more to support workers, especially those with barriers to employment in lifelong learning? I think now is an excellent time to have that conversation because more than ever, employers are really looking at thinking out of the box about how they can meet their workforce needs. In Colorado, we have two jobs that are open for every unemployed person. I know there's many jurisdictions across the country that have a similar dilemma. So uh, now's the time to really convene, as we have in Colorado, many of the key employers, and that means at the county level, it means at the state level, at the regional level, and really talk about how we can improve the pipeline of talent to further their success. And we're looking at lining our workforce dollars, some of which are ARPA dollars, with meeting the needs of the growing private sector in our state. I met with one of the leaders of one of our great community colleges just yesterday and um, talked to her about what we can do to get more uh, 
older students, students with families, back into the system. And she talked about needs including childcare, transportation, uh, nutritional benefits, and mental health issues. Uh, unfortunately, some across the aisle feel that these investments should be cut. And you noted in your testimony that wraparound services are part of Colorado's investments in the workforce. Do you feel that these services have increased retention and increased the number of people who can, can come into these workforce development programs? Uh, without a doubt, uh, making sure that people can get to workforce training programs helps improve participation for those for whom transportation was a barrier that they couldn't overcome on their own. Uh, we're also partnering with our community colleges and colleges to provide additional on-site childcare opportunities. And by the way, that benefits their workforce as well as the students. So That's both for attracting and retaining the support staff they need as an institution, as well as for the students, the availability of lower cost on-site daycare is critical. That's great to hear. I'm gonna stick with you and I wanna ask you one more question. And that is about one of the real crises in our schools, and that is youth mental health. You noted in your testimony that Colorado is expanding mental health supports for students and offering free therapy sessions with mental health professionals. Uh, as your administration has begun implementing these programs, have you seen an impact on student populations? Yeah, the demand has been huge, getting the word out, particularly for students who otherwise have barriers to access. And that can be geographic, it can be a rural area, it can be a cultural or familial barrier where they don't know where to go or who to ask for help. And really making it easy and convenient uh, has absolutely helped lead to improved learning outcomes as well as helped uh, make sure that we are a safer state. Thank you. I'm not sure I'm going to get a gold star, but I yield back. I told you we're working on some kind of recognitions here. Uh, Mr. Bean, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fox. Good afternoon to you, and good afternoon, Education and Workforce Committee. It's good to see everybody. Dr. Fox, I'm going to give you a gold star because uh, you have shed the uh, or shined the spotlight on a... Uh, on a crisis, it's in education. I have uh, I come from the free state of Florida where I've served 10 years on the front lines of legislating uh, ways to improve education, empower parents, and really focus on results. Some of the legislation has been talked about in committee, and I'm gonna talk about it back to let you know the real story of what we've done in state of Florida. Now, don't trust me. Go look at our state's report card, or you can look at parents who have voted with their feet to come to the state of Florida uh, with, the, with the reason being they wanted, they wanted their kids back in school. That's what, they, uh, that's what they wanted. So in the free state of Florida, what we've discovered is uh, education and kids do better when there's live instruction. They do better when schools are open. They do better when parents are involved and empowered. They do better, as uh, Governor Polis said, when there's choice, because all kids are, in fact, uh, different. And they also do better when there's more time focused on the things that mattered. A couple of the legislation uh, uh, bills that were, were talked about is the so-called Don't Say Gay bill, uh, which has nothing to do with uh, anything about gay or, or or anything the other opponents want to say about it. What it does say, and I wish I could name the bill. In fact, let's do it right now. There's a new name for that bill, and it's called Let Kids Be Kids Bill. Because there is no reason whatsoever that we should be teaching sex or any of the, the, the we shouldn't be teaching sex to kindergartners, first, second, third graders. That's what that bill says. Let's teach age appropriate things, and hey, Let's teach things, uh, subjects that matter, reading, writing, arithmetic. And as so-called uh, the CRT, we said no in the state of Florida, no to CRT. There's no value. There's no value to teach kids to hate each other based on race. There's no value in teaching kids to feel guilty just because they're of a certain race or persuasion. Let's teach them, uh, here's a novel idea, let's teach them reading or math, or science. So my first question, I've got questions for every single one of you, and that is, uh, Miss Gentles, what can we do? And this is new to me at, on a federal level because this is, the action is at the states, but what can we do on a federal level to help states like the free state of Florida better their education system? Well, we certainly need to, to celebrate states like Florida who, um, 
were, were success stories when it came to the NAEP scores and success stories for keeping schools open and um, ensuring that academics are, are at, the, at the center. Um, a, a big thing that the that the committee can do is support school choice legislation that does happen at the at the federal level for states who are very different than Florida and don't have an array of options. And so ensuring that charter school program receives sufficient funding, um, taking a look at that um, um, edu education tax credit program that would provide options for students in states that don't have robust choice programs. That's definitely something that can be done at the federal level. And then again, reminding parents of, uh, of their rights under PPRA, under FERPA, ensuring that states and districts are not lying to parents about what Title IX does and does not do. That should be uh, something that, that, the, that the committee could do. Ms. Gentles, thank you so much. That is the right answer, the answer I was hoping for to continue to push states. I'm running out of time. I've got a question for everybody. Let's make it a multiple choice uh, toss-up question for everybody, and that's it. I'm thinking about a bill. Our last meeting, our roundtable, was Dr. Fox did a focus on the disaster uh, we call the student loan program. Uh, so how can we fix it? My thought is, what if we did? What if we did a bill that... Uh, said uh, a college has to co-sign for the loan. So colleges are involved whether that loan is made. Is that a good idea, a bad idea, or an idea worth exploring? Uh, Mr. Pulsifer. Yeah, thank you for that question. I think that uh, there certainly are ways by which if you increase institutional accountability or risk sharing in the cost of attaining a degree, that would increase the incentive to control good the idea. cost of attaining the degree. Thank you. Uh, Governor Polis, good idea, worth exploring? Hurry. Hello we from the free state of Colorado. Um, aligning incentives uh, to outcomes. There's a lot in uh, Mr. Pulsifer's uh, testimony about that, and I, I generally agree with the directions that he indicated in his testimony. Good idea. Thank you so much. Uh, and, uh, Sullivan. Sure. Uh, not a big uh, student loan uh, participant in terms of our students because our price point is relatively low, but I would say to you we already have Title IV provisions that require institutions to be partners. Uh, in the form of return to Title IV. So I would, I, I would suggest to you it's probably not a bad idea. Thank you. Yield back. Thank you very much. Ms. Wild, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Chairwoman, I, I'm not sure I'm going to get a gold star here, but I'm going to try. Um, I was encouraged when I read the testimonies of the witnesses getting ready for this hearing because I found a number of points of agreement with each of you. And um, in fact, much of this, this hearing has uh, addressed points of agreement. But, but it, there are a few areas that I really need to hone in on. Um, I do want to say, I want to make a couple of observations at the outset. I, here I am as almost the last witness or the last person to question. So I've heard a lot um, in the course of this hearing. Uh, and my observations, first of all, to my colleague um, and to anybody who th believes otherwise, CRT, otherwise known as critical race theory, is not taught in the K-12 schools, ever. Um, and the, this is a, a talking point that has been used by the opposition party to try to inflame parents and people, and it is simply not done. We need to stop talking about it. Number two, um, there is a reference in at least one testimony to cruel COVID-era closures of schools. I'd like to point out that the COVID era closures of schools started under President Trump. Um, and I'm not suggesting that it was inappropriate, but this seems to be something that is consistently blamed on the Biden administration and Democrats. And it is very important to note that the schools were closed um, in roughly March of 2020 when President Trump was still president. Third, I've heard a lot of comments about teachers and teacher unions, or I've read about a lot in the testimony, almost suggesting that they are the root of all problems in our schools. You know, it, it seemed to me, I, it was refreshing when we were going through COVID and so many of these kids were learning at home online. It was so refreshing to hear parents say, now I really appreciate my kids' teachers because they understood just what a challenge it is to teach. So those are my observations. On to the points of agreement. Uh, Dr. Sullivan, I agree with your testimony that Pell needs to be expanded to include uh, workforce programs. Mr. Pulsifer, I agree that higher ed must meet the, 
the needs of the workforce and that higher ed must create value for the students and higher ed must be accessible, tra traversable and equitable. Just want you to know all the things I agree with you on. Mrs. Gentles, I agree with you that far too many forces within the education system insist on prioritizing the promotion of ideologies over academic instruction. Um, I agree with you that we need oversight and accountability of emergency federal funding to schools. And I think the Biden administration is actually doing that um, oversight and accountability of those funds. And I agree with you that far too many classrooms are chaotic and sorely in need of programs that support mental health and discipline. Um, and we do disagree, however, on where these ideologies that you spoke of are coming from. Um, and I want to start with talking about the effort to ban books in public school districts across our country. We've heard from PEN America that 138 school districts across 32 states banned books from the summer of 2021 to the summer of 2022. These bans affected 4 million students nationwide. 41% of the banned books over this time period featured LGBT themes or characters. 40% featured characters of color. 21% dealt with issues of race and racism. Do you believe that all of those books uh, in those categories should be banned? That's just a yes or no question. Uh, no, I'm not a supporter of book bans. Okay, so good. Then we, you probably would agree with me then that this nationwide movement to prohibit students from reading certain books is an attempt at, ideological indoctrination in our public education system, which was exactly what your testimony did not like, did not want to see? I would uh, want to point out that the books that are being brought up and, and questioned, not banned, but questioned, are generally of a very ex sexually explicit in nature, regardless of the other themes and the, the, the focus of, or the main characters in those books, the sexually explicit nature of the books, particularly when you're talking about graphic novels that are aimed at younger emerging readers, those are, um, those are, are the primary concern. So I, I think we could probably agree that sexually explicit material should not be given to young elementary school students. But can we agree that it's important with older students to teach the skill of critical thinking? We absolutely agree that critical okay. thinking is Meaning important. Meaning the ability to look at a situation, weigh the evidence, look at the trustworthiness of a source, particularly now with rampant social media that spreads all kinds of things, and arrive at a person's own conclusions based on the evidence. You like that idea? Absolutely. Okay. And this is best done by exposing people, and I, I'm not talking about four and five years old. This is best done by exposing people to different ideas, teaching them about the sources, and letting them evaluate the evidence. True? Yes. Okay. So in general, would you agree? Yes. I told you I wasn't going to get a gold star. <laughs> Thank you. I yield. Thank you. Uh, I am going to give Mr. Kylie a cold star for being here and being so patient today because he has sat through this entire hearing waiting to be, oh, oh. Miss Hayes, too. Okay. Uh, Happy to Ms. share the gold star. Thank you. Thank you. You're, you're recognized. Uh, Governor Polis, thanks uh, very much for being here uh, today. Um, I believe you're the founder of a charter school yourself. Is that right? That's correct. Two. Two, two charter schools. And you've been uh, a strong supporter of charters uh, in Colorado. Uh, as you know, uh, after President Biden took office, the administration almost immediately set out to target charter schools uh, with proposed rules that, as you put it, would, quote, gut the federal charter schools uh, program. And you wrote a letter to Secretary uh, Cardona in which you said you strongly oppose the Department of Education's proposed new rules. Now, I have to say, when you were asked about this earlier, you seemed to hedge a little bit uh, saying that, well, different states have different authorizing laws, uh, but there was no hedging in this letter. Uh, you uh, celebrated the national impact of charter schools. You wrote, around the country, public charter schools are making a difference in students' lives. During the 2020-2021 school year, nearly 240,000 new students enrolled in charter schools across the country. You also wrote in this letter, it is confounding and deeply disturbing that the Department of Education would even want to consider 
making the opening of high quality charter schools considerably more difficult than ever before. Our students need more public school options and high quality charter schools play a critical role in providing that access. So I don't wanna put you in a tough spot. I'm coming at this from someone who is very interested in bipartisan education reform. I'm a former high school teacher myself, very interested in working on a bipartisan basis to expand educational opportunity, to expand high quality public school options, to close achievement gaps. Uh, and I have found some uh, partners on the other side of the aisle. I hope to have the chance to collaborate with you as well. Uh, but I have to say, it's been few and far between. With many in your party, it's like running into a brick wall. The only interest they have in charters is how to uh, harass them, uh, how to target them, how to get rid of them. Uh, in my state, California, the governor and supermajority have been condemned time and time again by civil rights groups for their rel relentless attacks on charter schools. So you're the chosen witness here of the minority at today's hearing. I just wanted to get your help in understanding. Why do you think so many elected officials in your party are hostile to charter schools? Well, I don't think that, uh, I don't see charter schools as a partisan issue. In our state, about 15.2% of kids who go to public school go to attend a public charter school. I founded a charter school for new immigrants uh, and English language learners and one for kids who were uh, experiencing insecurity in housing. Um, and again, I, I was uh, pleased that the final rule, again, while I didn't think the rule was necessary for the Department of Education, it did incorporate uh, many of the changes that I suggested, that others suggested uh, involve with charter schools. This is around a funding stream that specifically supports new charter schools, and it's very important. I uh, helped write some of the legislation when I was here around that piece of the Every Student Succeeds Act, uh, and it's really important to support innovation. I think it's a high return investment. It's a small dollar amount, high return. Uh, it's also important to note that not every idea is gonna work out, and, and that's okay. Just as every charter school doesn't work out, every new district initiative doesn't work out, uh, but if you're not trying to do something different, uh, then you're doing things the same I'm way. Sorry, my time, my, my time is limited, so I just want to get back to the question sure. because it has become a partisan issue. It was this administration that almost immediately went after charter schools. And as you well know, uh, it's the, the opposition to charter schools uh, largely comes from uh, the other side of the dais. We've heard some comments today, so I want to get your thoughts on this. Why has it become a partisan issue? Because I agree with you, it shouldn't be. Well, again, I, I, uh, President uh, Obama was uh, very supportive of uh, high-quality charter schools. I have every reason to believe the Biden administration is also supportive of high-quality charter schools that improve equity and access. Uh, I think what they're pointing out, and again, I don't always agree with uh, everything that uh, they've said, is they're, even, they're more concerned about the equity and access piece. And I think it is complicated how charter schools affect equity and access. Depends on the particular charter school, depends on, 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 on the attendance, depends on the recruitment. Uh, uh, and yes, some states and some school districts have better or worse authorizing laws than others. We're proud of our authorizing laws in Colorado, and we hope to improve them even more. Do you have any other theories as to why it is that in some states we have overwhelming opposition to charters from one side of the aisle? Uh, well, there's certainly states that have worse uh, charter authorizing laws. And so frankly, they've had some negative experiences with charters that we haven't seen in Colorado. Uh, in Colorado, uh, we've seen them as a very constructive, innovative part of public education. Uh, and there's enormous demand uh, for uh, d differentiated programs. And by the way, districts have learned from practices in charter schools and districts have improved and offered new programming in district schools as well. Well, thank you. I appreciate your commitment to doing the right thing for students, and I uh, would encourage you to have uh, conversations with uh, some who are uh, less willing to take that same approach. Thank, thank you very much. Ms. Omar, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman. Um, I wanted to enter this um, article in, uh, to the record from the Florida Phoenix. Um, I know the gentleman is, is no longer here, uh, but he was speaking. Without objection. Thank you. He was speaking to how wonderful Florida was doing in regards to education, and I just wanted uh, this record to be entered into the record. Just 17% of eighth graders were proficient in math in Florida, and 6% were considered advanced in the subject in 2022. Um, I think it's really important for us to be able to share actual facts uh, in committees. Uh, and when it came to reading, 70% of eighth graders that were tested were not proficient in reading according to these results. 
Now, uh, Governor Bolas from the free state of Colorado, I greet you um, as uh, someone who represents the free state of Minnesota. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit uh, as, as a, both a parent, um, someone who sat on this committee, uh, and someone who now is a governor. As a mom of four children um, who are in the fifth grade, two uh, uh, juniors in high school, and one sophomore in college, is there any um, thing that is prohibiting parents from being involved in their children that you are aware of outside of time constraints that you and I might have? Uh, I, I think that um, language can sometimes be a barrier, and many of our school districts are taking great proactive approaches yeah, to But do you know of any laws that say a parent can't show up to BTA meetings no, or to school meetings? To the contrary, uh, we're really focused on how we get parents more involved. Yes. I participated in PTA meetings. I also was the guardian for two of my uh, nieces. Um, I went to almost all the school board hearings when my kids were younger, before I got elected to Congress. Um, I'm sure you were involved or would love to be as involved. You probably would try to go on all the field trips, talk to all the teachers. My dad actually was notorious in showing up to my school, sitting in the back of the classrooms when I was in high school to the point that it drove me and my classmates insane. I am not aware of, as you've just said, any decisions that are being made by lawmakers here in Congress, uh, by local lawmakers as saying we do not want parents' input, we don't want parents' involvement, we don't want parents' engagement in our schools. Uh, and so I, I, I just hope that we put this argument that is not based on the actual facts that are taking place in our communities to be put to rest. I also wanted uh, to congratulate you um, on uh, some of the work that you are doing in regards to addressing mental health issues uh, in uh, your state, some of the ways in which you are using the bipartisan uh, Safer Communities Act uh, that, that we passed. Our state is also doing some incredible work. In regards to higher education, I know that you uh, talk about the importance of holding institutions accountable for deceitful practices. Your former colleague, our Attorney General, Keith Ellison, um, shut down a company that was fraudulently promising student loan forgiveness to Minnesotans. Too often, these types of practices target veterans, they target immigrants, they target the most vulnerable. In the four years that I've sat on this committee, we've done a lot of work on accountability for, uh, for these type of practices, and I'm proud of what we have been able to accomplish. And I'm pleased to see that the administration is working um, on gainful employment regulations. From your perspective, what's the, why is the federal um, government uh, accountability important in higher education? It's important, of course, from the federal perspective and Congress's perspective, because these are taxpayer dollars that you are custodians of. It's important from the customer's perspective, the individual who's benefiting, so that they have the knowledge and the data to back it up that the time and effort that they're putting in to better their lives will actually produce better earning outcomes and a better life for them, and that they don't fall subject to a scam or, or somebody's attempt to, to take their money. Well, thank you, and again, I will say this is the Education Committee. We should be factual and talk about the truth. I yield back. Mr. Desaigne, you're recognized for five minutes, and I'm going to avoid responding to that right now. To the five minutes? No, <laughs> forget it. Well, thank you, um, Madam Chair. Thank you for ranking member. Thank you for this hearing. Thank you for the panelists. and. Uh, Governor, it's delightful to see you. I'm, you're triggering fond memories of a field trip that we took to the Bay Area when you were in the committee. And I don't know if the chair remembers our conversation on a waiting for a ride on a street corner in San Francisco, but we'll leave that for another venue. Um, Governor Polis, I want to talk about just following up on the questions about outcomes as a former employer, um, some of the comments about making sure that we're getting people trained um, for the workforce and transparency and data collection. So we have some support for the transparency 
um, Higher Education Act so that we make sure that the data is collected and we have that to prove the outcomes. I wonder if you have any comments on that. Um, I think the next kind of iteration and, and generation in, in outcomes, of course, uh, traditional measurements, uh, job placement, loan repayment rates are, are very helpful and constructive. Uh, I think the next generation will be looking at return on investment and ROI and seeing how you can maximize the ROI from both time and dollars in terms of increased earning potential uh, from the beneficiary. Okay. And I want to ask you some questions on a different subject matter that you've touched on specifically about ESSER funding and ARP and the requirements, the 5% and the 1% that we hold back. Now, we know in states like California, where I'm from, we did a lot of work. I led a bicameral, bipartisan task force on intercession um, and summer learning loss and nutritional loss around the state. And we've worked with, on a bipartisan level, to make sure that we extended the school year in California and other states have, like Colorado. And we've also provided more year-round after-school programs uh, again, it was a big issue for Governor Schwarzenegger. And now in California, we have free and reduced lunches with high nutritional standards year round that the state pays for largely. So I wonder if you could talk about, we were prepared in a way, not for the level of the pandemic, but we, were, we already knew about what we would lose when the kids weren't in the classroom. So there are other, are other options within the system that we're working on that increases performance, particularly for disadvantaged communities. You've de demonstrated leadership in your state on this issue. Um, it doesn't have to be all about the COVID experience. We've learned lessons and the, the model has changed. So the social model, two income households, kids out of school with more time alone. Maybe you could address your experience in Colorado with positive outcomes. First, it's very important to highlight that uh, these types of innovations that uh, California has undertaken, that Colorado, as the many states have, would not have been possible without the American Rescues Act, without ESSER. Uh, that's what really empowered states to be able to say, let's increase learning time, uh, which is a very data-driven intervention. Uh, and that's probably the single biggest utilization of funds, different ways of increasing learning time. It could be after school, summer programs, longer school year. Uh, these all take resources and take investment. Uh, the revenue, of course, from our school districts was static to some even, of course, down during the midst of the pandemic. So uh, really, these types of proven data-driven interventions that we know will improve student achievement would not have been possible without congressional action, that we're very grateful there. Now, that's the biggest bulk of it. On top of that, deployment of resources to address mental health challenges of students to make sure they're ready to learn. We talked about the nutritional element as well, housing security, a number of other social determinants of successful educational outcomes. But the single biggest is is just a very traditional time on task, data driven, it works, spending quality time, learning math, learning reading, helps the students get there. I appreciate that. And I would look forward to, we, got, we were able to get a bill that I was the author of out of the House Mental Health Matters Act. Uh, the chairman and I have had discussions about this when she was the ranking member. I look forward to engaging my colleagues on the other side on what we do about developing a workforce around mental health, particularly for young people. And um, yeah, I just really appreciate the comments. Madam Chair, I always look forward to positive reinforcement for you, so I'm gonna yield back with 40 seconds left. <laughs> Another gold star. Okay, great. Um, I'm gonna recognize the ranking member of the committee now for five minutes, Mr. Scott. Thank, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and uh, Governor, it's good to see you back. Um, I remember when you were a member of this committee, you had kind things to say about early childhood education. You mentioned that the um, child care aspects of it would benefit the parents. Could, could you say a word about the long-term benefits to the student? Yeah, several long-term uh, longitudinal studies uh, that have taken place over decades have showed the tremendous uh, benefit of early childhood education, uh, often to the tune of seven to twelve dollars for every dollar invested in quality early childhood education. Where do those savings come from? Better high school graduation rates, lower youth adjudication rates, less interactions with law enforcement, safer, higher earning potential. So a number of benefits uh, have been shown uh, from not just preschool and kindergarten, but quality birth to four as well, to make sure that uh, all kids have the advantage that some kids have of parents reading to them, of words spoken, of uh, books discussed, and that's important to bring to more children to address this achievement gap before it occurs. It's harder to address in third grade, in fifth grade, than it is to prevent it from occurring in the first place. 
And along those lines, I remember one thing you said, that uh, you were on a study committee when you were in the State Senate and concluded we're, we're talking about high school achievement. And the best way to improve high school achievement was to put all your money in early childhood education and wait 10 years. You have an excellent memory, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Ranking Member. So yes, the, the preface to the report, um, of course, it's no excuse not to reform our high schools now and we want to improve them, uh, but they will look much better and perform much better if every child gets a strong early childhood education. Uh, can you say a word about the importance of assessments and accountability in K through 12? Uh, yeah, assessments and accountability is critical, and that's one of the major deficiencies in some of these so-called choice models in state like, states like Arizona, where we won't even know, as a state, as a country, what works, what leads to increased student achievement, and what doesn't. It's important in higher ed, it's important in K-12. Um, if we're all about, and a number of members on both sides of the aisle have said, let's make sure kids learn math, reading, writing, that's what we should focus on. Uh, we need to make sure we know whether they are achieving at grade level in those areas. And therefore, uh, while no one enjoys assessment, it's really important to make sure that we're accountable for all students um, and that we can address uh, persistent achievement gaps that occur on racial lines, along income lines, along geographic lines, uh, and that we can have strategies to address those. Thank you. Um, Mr. Sullivan, you mentioned the uh, short-term Pell legislation that's pending now. Uh, you didn't mention last year the House passed a short-term bill. bill. Um, there was a specific amendment to the competes bill. The short-term bill had overwhelming Democratic support. Uh, the bill, competes bill passed with overwhelming Democratic support, but it did not survive. Uh, so there, and you've heard from this side, there is strong support. You've also heard uh, some problems with some of the uh, for-profit um, and what we don't want to happen is we have short-term pals and you set up some little storefront operations that deal out worthless credentials and take all the Pell money. The uh, question is, how would you differentiate the good programs from the bad programs? Great question, and thank you for your leadership around Workforce Pell and with this, uh, this group, this body in the past. Uh, I want to, you know, take take a, a step back for one second, and I, I would really like for you to think about uh, within the context of Workforce Pell, uh, we, we are opening up opportunities for people to be able to be educated in a shorter period of time. I, I know I've said that a couple of times, but it is so very important. Uh, we, 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 we agree on that. Our community colleges have programs, six to 16 weeks, Tremendous programs. The question is, if you open it up to everybody, you're gonna be wasting a lot of money unless you have a screen that only appropriate vendors can get access to it. And how do you separate the good from the bad? Look, it, it's, it's a matter of employment. Uh, it's a matter of earnings. It's about job demand. Uh, it's about ensuring that people get value from the experience. Uh, and uh, I, would, I would urge that we continue down the path on the accountability front. This issue is too big for America's public institutions only to solve. With 60 million adults with a high school well, diploma list. We're trying to write legislation. Let me ask um, the other witnesses if they would have a quick statement about how we can legislate that would divide the good from the bad. I would echo the fact that you should look at value and cost uh, rather than modality or method or delivery uh, mode. Uh, we certainly uh, do not believe that online, for example, is a great delimiter of quality. It's like the number of individuals today who are actually utilized in online mode, especially with public and private nonprofit institutions like WGU, it's ultimately about whether that program is delivered at a cost relative to the value of that program in the marketplace. Can you legislate along those lines? I mean, we've got to write legislative language it separates the good from the bad. Do you have examples of what we can use? Yeah, I certainly think that you can utilize things around key results around how do students complete those programs, what is the attainment rate of jobs and opportunities of, of completers of those programs, and what was that uh, value relative to the cost of actually completing the program. I think that that uh, increasing transparency and accountability at institutional level is certainly possible. I think the chairman's question is very important. I'm gonna let it go on, but don't talk, take too long, please. Yeah, and I'll be brief, and I applaud WGU for in the absence of federal criteria, really thoughtfully coming up with their own criteria and 
uh, that could help form part of a template uh, for what the federal government looks at uh, to maximize return on investment from investments that are that are made. Thank you, and and Madam Madam Chair, I think uh, you've heard from the answer that the for-profit nonprofit is not the split because there's some good for-profits and since they're bad nonprofits. We've got to figure out how to make sure that the money is being spent well, and I think we're in agreement on that, and it's an important um, possibility that we can uh, get done. Yes, sir. That's why I wanted to let the questions go on. I thought so. <laughs> Mr. Courtney, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairwoman, and, um, and thank you to all the witnesses. I've been really kind of in and out here today, um, and we appreciate um, you know, your patience and endurance uh, here uh, today. Um, you know, one area which uh, of American education that I believe is not in crisis is, uh, in fact, it's about as highly valued as uh, anything in the, particularly in the moment we're in, in terms of our economy is career and technical uh, education funding. Uh, the omnibus that we just passed actually boosted uh, the CT and E uh, account uh, by $100 million above last year. I come from a district, and, and the governor uh, remembers because we used to sit next to each other in this committee a number of years ago, and my friend from Connecticut knows this. Um, we have a shipyard that builds submarines, and the demand signal is off the chart in terms of uh, the Columbia class program and the Virginia class program. Um, the yard, the good news is, has gone from about 7,000 to about 13,000 workers. They've got to get up probably another 5,000. Uh, there's 1,600 job openings, um, mostly um, in the metal trades, welding, electrician, sheet metal, you name it. The career and technical education programs that are there are completely packed with waiting lists. Um, Secretary Cardona from Connecticut, who was a graduate of a tech school, came up and visited and, uh, again, is a passionate believer that we've got to sort of move this curriculum out to comprehensive uh, high schools, and that's actually what some of that new money that was in the, the omnibus is gonna be aimed at is in terms of trying to sort of push that out. But there is a problem, and the president talked about this last night, which is, um, so if you have a master welder teaching kids, you know, how to even just do almost intro welding, um, the good news is, is that when these kids graduate, even at high school age, they're probably starting at about $50,000 a year, and in no time, they're actually gonna be making more money than the master welder who's teaching um, in, in the program there. So trying to find a way to get the right skill set um, in, the, in the welding booths to teach you know, what is a critical occupation right now for the country in terms of these uh, programs is gonna require having to come up with a way to uh, pay for you know, the, the quality that you need. So I, I don't know if you're running into this, Jared, or Governor Polis in, in, in Colorado, but in the CT and E area there, you know, almost all of them are teaching skills that you could go out right now in this economy and get, make far more mm -hmm. than you could as a teacher. Yeah, I, I agree with the focus on increased resources and investment in career and technical. Uh, there's also opportunities, as you discuss, WIOA, for allowable use of funds uh, while students are still in school. Uh, as well as looking at additional uh, uh, partnerships with the private sector like we have through CareerWise where students are able to be placed for earn while you learn models while they're working. So in effect, a kind of apprenticeship model that can complement the traditional career and technical education model. Um, again, Mr. Sullivan, I know this is sort of in your space. I don't know if you had any comment. Again, about trying to get the people in the classrooms. Thank you for the question. Thank you for the focus on CTE. In particular, one of the, I mentioned earlier, one of the more difficult parts of creating the, the, um, the capacity is identifying that faculty member. So one of the things that we've done is work with our industry partners. As someone begins to look at retirement six months, nine months prior to retirement from one of our business partners, being able to slide that individual over into the classroom and allowing them to teach and to be able to give back has been a really successful strategy for us. And for that group, they're not as concerned about the pay. They are concerned about giving back. And so that has been a great strategy. But what I know for certain is we do not have enough retirees to be able to meet that capacity And I was just issue. gonna chime in with that point because uh, we were, it's, they're tapping into that same pool, and a lot of them are just super passionate about mentoring and, right. you know, really, um, you know, teaching people that manufacturing is not a dirty 
you know, um, sort of dismal job. But the fact of the matter is, is that's a, a really unreliable pool. I mean, you, we, we have to figure out a way, again, to get the, the people who have the talent and who know, I mean, welding, an admiral who was down there once described, a ma you know, a nuclear welder is about as skilled as a brain surgeon. I mean, there's no margin for error when you're building a vessel that does not, you know, su support human life. And so, um, again, I think it's, it's just something we have to think about in terms of this question about, you know, 11 million job openings in the economy, highly concentrated in manufacturing, and how do we get people connected with the right teachers um, to make sure that um, they can help the country and succeed for themselves? I yield back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Courtney. I'll now recognize myself for five minutes. Um, and I've got th three questions to ask, so I will ask you all to keep that in mind. Um, Mr. Pulsifer, you have you brought out uh, from both sides of the aisle the interest in ROI. It's clear that it's, there's bipartisan support for that. Could you briefly describe how this metric could be applied in the broader post-secondary context, risk sharing, performance bonuses, uh, offer uh, in-demand high quality credentials, mm -hmm. just a few more points on what you brought up before. Uh, and the ones you touched upon, risk sharing is an excellent example. Um, oh, sorry, Mr. Pulsifer. <laughs> <laughs> two, P's, two P's next to each other. The, uh, um, uh, thank you, Chairwoman. Um, I do think the more we can bring a spotlight to value, the better, for, that's for sure. I, I, I would share with you uh, some of the things that we've held ourselves accountable to, uh, that you absolutely, to increase value, you have to increase completion rates, so you have to look at how well are students who are beginning the program, completing the program. You then have to look at, at whether or not having completed that program, are they actually attaining employment in the field of study, and are they achieving the economic return on that, and what does that look like for the students through that program? Third, you absolutely have to be able to look at the cost of completing that program. There's no doubt that uh, in many programs today that the wage for those, you know, completers of that program has not increased at the same rate the cost to achieve it has. I certainly believe that, uh, at, that we can increase uh, reporting and accountability at institutional level for such metrics. Uh, we certainly can also involve accreditors of looking at institutions to present their plans to improve those outcomes. And when we do so, we can then give that information to students so they're making better choices about their future. Thank you. I appreciate that. Ms. Gentles, um, I want to um, go back to um, Mr. Bowman asking you a question about balanced literacy and phonics-based reading instruction. Uh, there was a follow-up with Ms. Houchin. Mr. Bowman didn't give you a chance to respond, but I know from my reading, there's significant research showing what does and does not work when teaching kids to read. Could you respond to Mr. Bowman's argument that balanced literacy is an effective approach to reading instruction? Right, well, reading influences every aspect of life, and we know that uh, students are learning to read up until third grade, and then from there, they are reading to learn. And uh, unfortunately, for too long, there's been this balanced literacy approach that has taught the ch children to read the wrong way, and the cueing that we were briefly discussing is a, an important component of that, which essentially tells children to memorize some words guess based on pictures and clues and context, and then skip words that they're not familiar with. So this guessing learning of, uh, of reading is a, a huge reason that we have such abysmal literacy rates. And fortunately, there's a, a, an, um, an effort to address this. Um, but what we heard um, as well today is that the, the that children with dyslexia and other learning disabilities are the ones who are extremely harmed by this. Children with, with disabilities um, suffered in the, in the COVID closures and they've suffered for, through these awful literacy uh, programs that have been debunked and uh, their needs need to be prioritized going forward. Right. And I'm, I'm very pleased that we have Ms. Houchin on the committee because I know she's going to bring uh, some great uh, wisdom to this issue along with some others. Um, oh, I've got to keep track of my, my questions here. Um, Mr. Sullivan, I'd, I'd like you to, um, I've lost my question. Goodness gracious here. Um, uh, you have recommended to address the problem of 
people not using WIOA, companies not using WIOA, uh, you addressed the problem. You recommended improving coordination with the Higher Ed Act. Right. Could you talk a little bit more about that and how we could have a better coordination between the two systems and that would lead to more workers gaining in-demand skills? Thank you for the question. Uh, let me begin by just pointing out that we have two primary funds in this nation that fund talent, the Pell Grant and WIOA. I have a question for you. Why would we keep them separate? We're trying to accomplish one workforce in this nation and yet we're using funds from two different instruments that have lots of different prescriptive rules around them that make it exceptionally difficult to accomplish the goal that we have set out. And so at a minimum, a level of coordination that focuses the United States dollar on solving the issue at, at hand. And, I, and I'm, I'm gonna take a little point of personal privilege uh, here to say I, I think everybody who's going into any kind of education program is looking to come out with a career. So I've been preaching for a long time that whether you get a baccalaureate degree, whether you get a diploma, whether you get a certificate, you are in career education. And I dislike very much separating one kind of education from another kind of education. So I have talked about that a lot because I do, again, I was getting an English degree. I wanted a job. If you're going into learning to weld, you want a job. And I think it's really terrible that we are separating people that way. And so I really appreciate you bringing that up and giving me the opportunity to respond to that. I do think it's something we have to really focus on. And I think uh, talking more about short-term Pell and how we can help people gain skills that will lead them to a career, whether it involves a baccalaureate degree, a master's degree, or a doctorate, or whatever that is. But we desperately want people to get skills to be able to improve their lives in the long term. So uh, I want to thank all of you uh, for being here today. I think we've had an excellent hearing. Governor Polis, I appreciate you very, very much. Uh, for coming back, and I, you and I have always, I've always felt you had great common sense, and you proved it again today, and uh, I appreciate it. And I'm, I, I'm very pleased we've had this as our first hearing, and we have a lot of work to do for the American people, so thank you all for coming and uh, sharing your wisdom with us, and I thank everybody in the, in the audience. The meeting is adjourned. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Sorry. <laughs> Whoa. Sorry. Go ahead. It's all right. I re we said this once, but we'll remind it again. We remind colleagues that pursuant to committee practice, materials for submission for the hearing record must be submitted to committee clerk within 14 days following the hearing, preferably, earlier it said must be, Microsoft Word format. Materials submitted must address the subject matter of the hearing. Only a member of the committee or, an, or a, an invited witness may submit materials for inclusion in the hearing record. Documents are limited to 50 pages each. Documents no longer uh, than 50 pages will be incorporated into the record via an internet link uh, that you must provide the committee within the required time frame. But please recognize that, the year, that years from now that link may no longer work. Pursuant to House rules and regulations, items for the record should be submitted to the clerk electronically. I've already said thank you very much for your participation. There may be additional questions, uh, and we'd ask that um, you would answer those in writing. So um, witness questions for the hearing record must be submitted to the majority committee staff or committee clerk within seven days. The questions submitted must address the subject matter. Now. There being no further business, without objection, the committee stands adjourned.